At Wildlife Conservation Network, we believe there is hope for even the most threatened species. And we know it will take a community working together to make that hope a reality. That's why we invest in local leadership and conservation around the world. Support a network of partners with bold, effective solutions. And establish wildlife funds to save a threatened species across its entire habitat. We connect donors with the conservation work they support and ensure 100% of their money goes to the work they care about. Together, we are building a world where people and wildlife can coexist and thrive. WCN is perhaps the most extraordinary and successful conservation organization anywhere. Join us in creating a future for wildlife. Greetings and welcome to the 20th Anniversary Wildlife Conservation Network Expo. My name is Charlie Knowles. I'm the president and co-founder of WCN. And as I think about the past 20 years, I could not be more thankful for the hard work and dedication of all the conservationists and the hard work and dedication of the WCN staff, which has led to major conservation successes on all seven continents. And thanks to the donors for nearly $250 million deployed to the field. Thank you. I know today you're joining us from all over the world, and if you haven't done so already, go down to the chat, let us know where you're joining us from. And whether you're a conservationist, a donor, a student, or just curious, and whether you're new to WCN or you've been involved for many years, thank you for being a part of the community. Thank you for your commitment to wildlife conservation. We're gonna have a fabulous week of presentations and none of it would have been possible without the hard work of the WCN staff and the conservationists. They're gonna take you to all reaches of the world to meet some incredible conservationists and hear some amazing stories. So have an incredible week. Thank you for joining us. And without further ado, it is my great privilege and honor to introduce WCN's Executive Director, Dr. Zizhe Colomb. Zizhe? Well, thank you, Charlie, and uh, welcome to all of you to kick off this Expo Week. We're, we're especially thrilled to be celebrating WCN's 20th anniversary with all of you because the impact we've had on wildlife and communities around the world would not have been possible without your trust and generous support. So thank you from the bottom of our heart. I'm also deeply thankful for our Expo sponsors, the Gordon Betty Moore Foundation and the Walt Disney Company. Now, some of you have been with us since the very beginning, uh, gathering in Charlie's living room, then at Foothill College, then in San Francisco. In fact, I kind of want to have fun, and uh, and I want you to tell us when you attended your first expo. So there's a, a poll tab on the platform that you can use, or you could put it straight in the chat. I'm going to see if I could get some of those uh, live answers. Not seeing anything on the poll yet. Um, or maybe uh, I'm not seeing anything come through, but... Uh, I know that some of you have been joining since 2002, 2005, 2018. Um, we've really come a long way from our humble beginnings to this global community able to connect from all over the world. And I actually hope to see many of you at our in-person celebration on Friday night at the Sydney Goldstein uh, Theater here in San Francisco with our good friend, Dr. Jane Goodall, and our growing network of conservationists. There are still a handful of tickets left, so if you're local to the Bay Area or you want to take a vacation and come out here, uh, head on to wcnexpo.org and purchase a ticket to join us live. We also recognize that some of you may be new to the Wildlife Conservation Network, so I want to extend a very, very warm welcome to you. And I want to take a moment to uh, introduce you to who we are and, and what we do. Our mission is to protect endangered animals by supporting conservationists to ensure wildlife and people coexist and thrive. To achieve this, we're guided by core values, and I'll highlight just a few. The first, people and community. Conservation is really about choices that people make from the most remote corners of the globe all the way to here. And as we make more space for more diverse voices in conservation, we reach better outcome for coexistence with wildlife and with each other. Second value is collaboration. We have a deep respect for what everybody brings to the table. So from donors to conservationists to local communities, we foster partnerships. Third is efficiency. We really uh, run lean with an entrepreneur spirit to have uh, impact. And we put over 90% of our funds towards our programs. And finally, transparency. If you designate your donation to a particular program, such as one of our partners or our funds, 
we guarantee that 100% of that donation goes to that program in the field. Overall, we believe in investing in and supporting conservation entrepreneurs so that they can achieve their missions faster and better. And we do this through three core strategies. First, we invest in local conservation organizations whom we invite to join our partners network. We also invest in local conservationists at different points in their career. And when appropriate, we leverage the collective impact of multiple conservation projects to reverse the decline of species in crisis across their entire habitat through our wildlife funds. Now, these wildlife funds that include uh, elephants, lions, rhinos, pangolins, and in a, in a different twist, actually, connectivity for pumas in California. These wildlife funds have invested in almost 700 projects from a wide range of organizations, kickstarting new approaches for conservation or, or bolstering tried and true approaches in over 50 countries. Over the past 20 years, we've awarded 174 scholarships for local nationals in 46 countries to pursue graduate studies. And this year in 2022, we proudly launched a new program uh, designed to provide uh, flexible support, peer learning, funding, and mentorship for emerging African conservationists. Through our network of conservation partners, we find and we vet the best local entrepreneurial conservation organizations who deploy the most effective solutions for wildlife, and we provide them with support and the tools and connections they need to bring these solutions to life. This year, again, we welcomed five partners to the network, expanding our impact to macaws in Costa Rica, cranes in Rwanda, mountain gorillas in Uganda, marine mammals and orangutans in Malaysia. Our conservation partners network now includes 22 conservation organizations and we aim to grow it substantially in the coming years, broadening the impact of these local conservationists. Now we know you wanna find these conservationists and they actually wanna find you too. And we know it's not easy. So this is where WCN can really help. We're happy to bring you together and to unlock your common passion for wildlife for extraordinary partnerships because none of us can do this by ourselves. So the Expo is really about celebrating the work we've achieved together and fostering existing as well as new connections among all of us to have greater impact. Starting today and throughout the week online and all the way to Friday, the Friday Expo celebration in San Francisco, you're gonna hear from conservationists on the front line, honestly sharing the challenges they face, the successes they've had and the opportunities to do more together. Uh, the Expo is a key part of, uh, of being in touch with conservationists. And one of the silver linings of the past two years is that we really tapped into the power of remote communication so that we can bring the inspiring work of conservationists in the remote parts of the world straight to wherever you are. We have a great platform to engage with conservationists and with ourselves, uh, with all of you. Uh, a, lot of it, a lot of you have used it before, um, so you're probably quite familiar with it. If you're new to it and you're actually hearing me and seeing me now while well, you figured out the basics and it's pretty easy from here on out. But if you need help, uh, check out the tutorial video in the reception area, which is accessible on the left side of your screen. And there's also um, a help booth in the exhibitors area. The reception area is, is one of multiple areas you can explore on this platform. It's, it's like your information central where you're gonna find information about um, the projects, about the schedule of a day, um, figuring out what's going on the rest of the week. So make sure that you check it out and see the speaker lineup. Another area I really want you to visit is the exhibitor's booth, uh, which is uh, also on the left side of the, of the Hopin platform, where all the expo speakers have virtual booths. And these booths are gonna be open all week with general information about their projects. They're gonna have links to their social media pages, and they're gonna list times at which the conservationist will be live in those booths so that you can come back and engage with them via video or text chat. So make sure to take advantage of that. If you're so inclined, of course, a conservationist uh, would deeply appreciate any contributions you can make to their work. Uh, remember, no donation is too big, no donation is too small. Uh, remember also that WCN guarantees that 100% of contributions that are designated for a project will go to that organization. So we have a donate button on the left side of the platform. Uh, there are also donate links uh, or buttons in each of the booths. You can also go on our website. We make it pretty easy for you to figure out how to support these conservationists. Um, our website is www.wildnet.org, and I'm sure they'll be uh, listed in the, in the chat at various points. One thing we really love about the WCN community is being able to interact with each other. And the exhibitors booth is one way to do that. The poll that we used earlier is another way to do that. Uh, I'm now seeing actually some of those results, but it's, uh, I've moved on from that. Um, 
And then we also have a, a people function where you can chat with each other. Uh, you can chat with everybody who is attending this event, or you can look for a specific individual and send them a, a chat within this platform. Now, please remember to be um, courteous and, uh, and to be respectful in all your communications and try to keep it as focused on the work at hand. Finally, right now we're in the stage area, which is where the presentations will be delivered. Uh, we only have one stage for this expo. Right after me, you're gonna hear about African elephants and Asian elephants. And then we'll move on to small cats, snow leopards, giraffes, and saiga antelopes. On Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, join us back for an hour each day at different times to engage with over a dozen different conservationists from the deep forests of the Congo to the peaks of the Andes, without forgetting our oceans and our coastlines. You'll hear about uh, women dedicated to save wildlife, about efforts to combat wildlife crime, about wild places, life aquatic, so rhinos, spider monkeys, corals, manatees, okapis, and more. It's all gonna be there. And all these talks will be recorded and available for viewing and sharing in the replay area of the of Hopin platform, as well as on our YouTube channel. But really, we encourage you to join us live because when you join us live, you can interact with a conservationist and that's where most of the fun takes place. So thank you, thank you for being with us. And without further ado, I wanna turn it over to the people that you really wanna hear from, the conservationists. So first, um, we'll hear from our partners in Kenya, Save the Elephants. Save the Elephants is a, a pioneer for cutting edge scientific insights into elephant behavior, intelligence, uh, long distance movement, applying these insights to the long-term challenges of elephant conservation so that these animals uh, can have a, a secure future in today's rapidly changing world. Today's presentation is focused on, on one aspect of our work, which is to engage communities in Kenya to be ambassadors for wildlife. So after a virtual field visit, we'll be joined by Nancy Odweo, who is head of grassroots conservation education, and Esther Serem, community outreach manager at Save the Elephants. And as will be the case with all the conservation presentations, we'll have a live discussion with those conservationists. You can already send in your questions via the chat functions. You could also doing, uh, do so during the Q&A, and I'll make sure to relay it over to them, and we'll have a wonderful conversation with them. So now, without further ado, let's head out to Kenya. Thank you so much. I remember clearly when I was young, elephants would wander near our homes with ease. We were at one with elephants and we coexisted peacefully. But since then, things have changed a lot. As you can see, human population have increased hugely and livestock keeping is switching to agriculture. Coexistence has turned to conflict and there is growing resentment among Kenyan communities towards elephants. I am Lemayan Kennedy. I come from a nomadic pastoralist community, the Samburu. In our culture, elephants are considered to be fellow tribesmen. And when an elephant dies, we follow through the same rituals as the death of a human. We place green twigs on the carcass just as we, as we place flowers on our beloved ones. Suddenly, this folklore is fading away now, and as more and more Samburus switch from pastoralism to agriculture, it's not uncommon for Samburus to kill elephants. I have loved elephants since when I was young. I remember running to the edges of our farm just to see their dung and footprints and the direction they have moved. I was always fascinated with their presence, yet at the same time terrified. Close to five years now, I have been working with Save the Elephants and I'm passionate about rekindling a closer relationship between my people and the elephants. It would be such a shame to lose an entire species that has been here longer than us. Hello from Kenya, my name is Nancy Odreo, the Head of Awareness at Save the Elephants. We are glad to be able to join you today and to be part of this year's Conservation Expo. Thank you, Kennedy, for setting the scene for today's presentation. My colleague Esther Serem and I are going to talk to you about the current challenges facing elephants, but also the different ways we are contributing towards solutions. Over the last couple of years, we've seen a reduction in poaching as the primary cause of elephant mortality. We are now seeing an increase in conflict, and this is not just threatening elephant survival. 
It's also threatening the livelihoods of communities that coexist with them. As keystone species, elephants are important in shaping landscapes, but they also hold significant cultural values to many communities. And in the face of habitat loss and habitat change, their conservation becomes that much more important. This year in particular, we've seen an increase in conflict that's exacerbated by drought. We've seen frequent movement of livestock into national reserves, which in turn drives elephants out of protected areas and into human settlements. Elephants are now damaging property, breaking water tanks in search of water, but also crop raiding extensively. It's unfortunate because the negative interactions are leading to either elephants being killed or injured by dis distressed communities or people getting injured or killed by elephants. Last year, one of our resident bulls called Sarara was speared as a result of conflict. He had a, a very big uh, spear sticking out on his side. Thankfully, the veterinary unit was able to tend to the wound and he got back on, on his feet. We also had an instance where a young girl walking to school encountered an elephant and was uh, severely wounded. Our response team was able to get to her on time and she received the urgent medical surgery that she needed. Unfortunately, such cases could be on the rise as conflict becomes more intensified and quite complex. But all hope is not lost. We are working on a toolbox of solutions to promote coexistence. And this include collaring and tracking elephants like Kir here. Um, knowing where collared elephants are helps with early warning which means our teams are able to, for example, intercept and um, steer elephants away from people and prevent potential injuries or damage. We are also working closely with communities to resolve conflict. Our rapid response unit in Arches Post, a town bordering Samburu National Reserve in Northern Kenya, are working with local partners to drive elephants away and keep people's homes uh, safe. I was able to speak to our director of uh, field operations, David Dublin. We also managed to visit uh, Wilson, one of our rapid response unit teams. We filmed this small snippet. Take a look. So we are at Muslim primary school where uh, elephants have broken down a part of their fence. Can you tell us what happened here? Muslim primary school is one of the uh, areas or places that are severely uh, affected, damaged by these bulls. And one of the reasons, or one of our suspicions is that they have a much bigger compound. There's a lot of acacia tortillas that are all having the pots now. And the most unfortunate thing is that these bulls don't really have uh, entry and exit. They just, you know, once they get in, they just use every single um, uh, sort of section of the compound. And that is exactly why there's so much damage, as you can see, all the way in this straight line. There's all these posts that are all bending. We've just found some elephants really close to the road. Um, I think it's Rita from the Poetics, right, David? Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, let's, let's, yeah. Let's go take a look at them. very close to uh, human settlement, very close to the air, uh, air to road, close to uh, people here, and uh, they're not even with their family. And, uh, the reason being is because it's so dry that, you know, there's just not enough food, and they just, um, females can actually split like this uh, and survive, you know, for the reason of just looking for food. We are with SP's Wilson Lokuku visiting the carcass of a female elephant who was recently killed by residents near Archer's Post. Um, what, what happened to this one? This elephant was killed after it killed two people here in Kwanja. Oh. So that's why the community killed her. Was it shot? Yes, she was killed. It was quite sad because going to be staying on that side where there are fewer people. Mm. As you see, the proximity of the people here, and this is where she killed people, maybe the community members and the people also identified her. But initially she was very quiet. Uh, she was trying to cross a road, she had a baby, mm -hmm. and 
people are throwing rocks, uh, people are hitting, the motorbikes are going for her, the trucks are going for her, uh, you know, just people hitting, and she, she must have been really, really mad. As you can see, our research team in northern Kenya have their hands full with the drought and elephants reacting in new ways. Meanwhile, we are working on longer term solutions. And now I'm going to hand over to my colleague Esther, who will tell you more. Esther, over to you in Sabo. Thank you, Nancy. And hi, everyone at WCN. I am Esther Sorem, the Community Outreach Manager based in the Savo Fieldside. It is an honor today to represent Save the Elephants in this virtual expo and to tell you more about some of our work at the Human Elephant Coexistence Program. Most of the conflict issues across the elephant ranges involve various forms of agriculture. Communities are now learning to deal with elephants that have already learned that raiding is a good source of good food as well as fast nutrition. As Nancy highlighted, drought this year has added fast effects on both elephants and communities and has also reduced agricultural yields. As a result, Communities that depend on subsistence farming are really suffering this year. And this has also impacted on our field activities. Due to the success of our beehive fences, Save the Elephants have now helped communities to implement more deterrent methods. And we've been able to develop a unique human elephant coexistence toolbox. Communities are now able to implement various mitigation measures to reduce elephant damage at their homes, food storages, water tanks, and also farms. For those hearing about beehive fences for the first time, these are free hanging beehives interlinked with wire every 10 meters and are placed right at the entry points of elephants. Just to let you know, elephants are afraid of bees. Just to bring you back to the human elephant coexistence toolbox, these are elephant mitigation methods that have been trialed and tested across various um, sites. And they consist of a range of desired methods for empowering communities to protect their livelihoods from elephants. These mitigation measures include methods for farm boundary protection, early warning system, elephant compatible, uh, you know, farming, elephant friendly uh, alternative livelihoods, tree protection also includes uh, shared space protection, for example, protecting school compounds from elephants. We have developed our first edition and we launched it during the World Elephant Day on the 12th August, 2022. Please visit our STE Coexistence Toolbox website to learn more about this specific toolbox. Since there are no crops at the moment at the farms due to the drought here, rural communities are less bothered with crop raiding elephants. However, they have no food and they have no any income. So they still need our help in finding and also implementing the alternative livelihoods that are elephant friendly. For the communities that Save the Elephants are supporting, women are leading the charge. Due to the Kenya society gender-based roles, women are typically in charge of looking for water, firewood, and food. This morning, I was out in the field with charity one of the leading ladies and a very honored lady in the community. We were able to discuss about how she's been able to adapt to the current droughts and also discovered how the various um, toolbox methods have been able to help our protect farm from elephants. Charity lives in Savo. Her crops are failed due to the drought, but Save the Elephants is supporting farmers like Charity with alternative livelihoods such as poultry farming. Charity, please tell us how this chicken has helped you in your family. 
Beehive fences are one of the methods that farmers like Charity use to keep crop breeding elephants away from their farms. To date, over 11,600 beehives have been installed across 87 sites in Africa and Asia. Charity also has a watchtower on her farm so she can keep an eye out for raiding elephants and warn our neighbors. Tunaangalia mahali wapo ndio tunaelezea majirani tunawapigia simu wanakuwa alert maana kama wanarudi pale huko watakuwa wanaambiwa kwa pale huko. Charity is an enterprising woman who is leading the charge and finding alternative ways to live in an ever changing and challenging landscape. In addition, we support a bigger group of 42 women from the community called Mlabini Basket Weavers through the Women Enterprise Center and with alternative livelihood options. I was with some of them earlier today. Please take a look. Mlabini Basket Weavers is a group of 42 women from this community. Let's, let's go meet the ladies. We are going to hear from some of them about how the Women Enterprise Center has helped people in their lives. Nini msaidi ya nikitengeneza ikisuka basket napata pesa. Nino huwa napata pocket money kwa kitu. Mimi kazi yangu ni kushona basket na huwa niko na target kabisa. Nashona nikijua kabisa kama za miezi miwili napeleka kare ya mtoto wangu ya tamzima. Apart from weaving, Mlabeni basket weavers engage in sewing of various beautiful customized products. Also, communities benefit from our elephant protection work. Thanks to our wonderful donors, we are able to support communities with non-conservation benefits. For example, if emergency drought relief for the school feeding programs that we started this year, medical and family planning help that includes supporting community health volunteers such as charity. Thank you, our wonderful and kind donors and friends and partners at WCN for your continuous and ongoing support. We were able to achieve all these because of you. Thank you for listening, and I will hand you back to Nancy to tell you more. Thank you. Thanks, Essa. As you can see, the challenge is rising across the continent as populations increase and land use changes. There's an urgent need for affordable, sustainable solutions to equip communities rather than create dependencies. And while people in affected areas have the will to implement new solutions, they often lack funding to uh, buy the necessary materials, either a bag of cement for walls or ing ingredients for smelly elephant repellents, or even putting up and maintaining beehive fences. We need your continued general support to be able to provide the guidance needed, including our new microgram scheme to support local communities. Working with partners like Kenya Wildlife Service, we also respond to conflict emergencies with support for both injured elephants and people. We also provide urgent medical care that would otherwise be unaffordable to local communities. With your donations, we can do all this and together continue our mission to secure a future for elephants. Thank you for joining us and for your time today. Wow. Uh, well, welcome back, everybody. Um, this has been a fantastic trip over to uh, to Kenya. We now have the, the pleasure of being joined by a couple of people from the Save the Elephants team. Uh, as it goes with live events, a few things change up. So we have uh, Nancy Odueyo, head of uh, Grassroot Conservation Education. Uh, we're still trying to get Esther Sarem, Community Outreach Manager at Save the Elephants. But we've gained um, Kennedy, who is a community outreach officer um, with Save the Elephants and who introduced the video. So welcome to both of you. It's a pleasure to have you with us. Uh, we'll see if uh, if Esther can join in and we'll uh, we'll bring her into the conversation. But um, I, I just wanted to get started and um, ask both of you quickly, 
how did you get started into this this line of work with um, with Save the Elephants? And maybe we'll start with you, uh, Nancy, and then move over to Kennedy. Right. Thank you, GJ. It's a pleasure to join this year's expo and to be able to meet everyone and talk about our work in Kenya. So um, I think in my case, you'd say it's a serendipity because um, way back when I was in high school in 2009, my auntie brought her along a newspaper for one of our big tables in, in Kenya called Safaricom. And in the middle of the page spread, there was Ian's work of tracking elephants with the GSM collars. And I thought, ha, huh, we can use uh, SIM cards to call, but we can also put them on elephants and know where they're, they're, they're going and what they're doing, who they're hanging out with. And I said, okay, uh, maybe I should uh, research more. And by the time I'm, I'm done with high school, see if there's an organization or even if we can, uh, if I can manage to work in Ian's organization, that would be lovely. So forgot about it for a couple of years. And then when I was applying for my courses in high school, I thought, huh, the elephant and the SIM card, that would be an interesting one. So ended up taking an undergraduate course in conservation and uh, got an internship with Save the Elephant and I've never left since. <laughs> Great, well, that's that's really fantastic. Uh, Kennedy, I'd, I'd love to also hear, hear from you as to how you got started. And I see that Esther has been able to join us. So we'll ask her the same question on how she got started. And then we'll take some questions from the audience. Thank you so much. I mean, um, for me, how I got started is that, you know, through listening to stories from our grandparents, um, that really interested me, um, hearing every time that elephants, hares, and, you know, all the animals are intelligent. Um, so I decided to um, sort of follow a career in that line just to find out if they are intelligent indeed, as they say. And I'm finding out that they are slightly more intelligent that, than we were told uh, they were. Um, uh, generally, growing up, I, I've grown up in Samburu and uh, going to school and having livestock came across lots of wildlife and later on realized, you know, that uh, they are abundance and diversity was really declining and that got me interested. And so that's how I got into conservation. Thank you, Kennedy. And, uh, and welcome, Esther. I'm glad you could join us. Um, same question to you. How did you get started in this line of work? Thank you very much. Um, basically, for me, um, it just started from high school when I went uh, for a trip into Masai Mara, and I just got to, you know, question why things are working the way they are. And then when I, I didn't really apply uh, a, a course in conservation, but then um, later I just joined university at, with wildlife management. And then later, uh, when I was in my third year, I was, uh, I had a lecturer who was really, um, you know, working with Save the Elephants. And then I asked her about how she, you know, her work in the um, conservation. And then she, she asked me to just apply for a volunteer kit in Save the Elephants. And that's how I got in since 2016 until now, I've been with the Save the Elephants. That's, that's fantastic. Um... It really goes to show the importance of uh, of being connected in the field, uh, seeing these things firsthand, and then the importance of education and and mentorship and having people who take interest and connect us. I think that's true everywhere. So we've got a question from Dr. Angeline Siegel, who who notes that it looked like a lot of your efforts are uh, at redirecting elephants and trying to ask them to change some of their behavior. But could you also talk to what you are asking humans to change in terms of their behavior? Uh, that isn't focused necessarily on um, on avoidance or maybe reinforcing territoriality. Right. Um, so uh, part of the the toolbox solutions that uh, Esther mentions in uh, in in the talk is uh, uh, harder safety awareness, and that's uh, very much coexistence education, targeting uh, young harders, most of whom, as Kennedy mentioned in his experience, are the ones who are. Uh, often looking after cattle and, and uh, bumping into elephants and other wildlife. So one of our target is to uh, bring education and, and uh, um, sort of try and, and offer solutions to people who interact with, uh, with elephants the most. And in, in this case, we thought young herders would be a, a very good demographic because a lot of the human injuries that we see involved uh, 
people who are out with cattle, in this case, the young hunters. Uh, we're also doing a number of community outreach programs, uh, and we are actively involving um, communities in our conservation work, uh, and also using them as ambassadors. And we also have a couple of uh, community meetings that uh, always uh, uh, organize with our partners and uh, uh, other uh, local uh, uh, entities outside of conservation, just to reinforce the message that look, things are changing over the years and we are having all these uh, um, uh, environmental challenges on top of um, uh, uh, drought and, and climatic uh, uh, changes happening. So it's, it's a mixed bag of uh, trying to manage elephant behavior, but also trying to uh, change human behavior by bringing, the, bringing them on board, but also um, working uh, towards solutions together in a collaborative manner. That, that's great. I think actually that touches on a question that Grady Noble asked, which was to, to look at how we could utilize educational programs with people in Samburu, but I would extend that to Samburu is in the northern part of Kenya. I would extend that to uh, all the people of Kenya so that right. they can all rediscover their love for elephants and what positive relationships um, we can have with these animals that can actually be hard neighbors. But could you maybe provide a, an illustration of, of the kind of, of behavior change that you're seeing some of the the communities um, do? Uh, would it be in terms of uh, how they approach their crops or how they deal with elephants when they come in? Can you just illustrate some of those behaviors that you're asking people to, to adopt that would lead to more coexistence with, with elephants? Yeah, so um, just to jump in, there's, um, we are trying different economic livelihoods that are compatible in, in different elephant ranges. Um, for example, in Savo, um, as Vesta explained in our video, currently they have a women enterprise center. And basically what they're doing is uh, basket weaving and as well people are planting non palatable crops to elephants. So this sort of reduces um, elephant travel and elephant interest in, in farms. Great, thank you. There's a question actually from Lee Berg that's quite specific that asks, um, isn't planting sunflowers helping to keep elephants out of agriculture area to help protect the elephant. Could you, could you speak a little bit about uh, sunflowers and elephants? Yes, um, I'll say uh, the farmers are now, adopt, you know, they are not 100% uh, changing to grow sunflowers, but at least they are adopting um, growing sunflowers in such a manner that uh, it, it doesn't attract the elephants into their farms. Um, and also we've helped them to find markets so that when they grow the sunflower, they are able to uh, sell them and be able to, to use that money to buy the maize or the uh, green crumbs that they want to buy. Um, and basically, you know, elephants don't like, or it's, I would say it's non palatable to the elephants. Um, and then we also have another crop such as chili, you know, f farmers grow with the chili, which is drought resistant. Also the sunflower can grow in a short period and also it's more, you know, it can grow in less with less rains and in this area of um, areas like such as Savo. Great, thank you. There's a question coming in from Nayana uh, Rathmal Goda. I'm, I hope I'm pronouncing the name right, um, which might be difficult to answer because I know you have a lot of, of, um, of great relationships and partnerships, but uh, I, she wonders if you could um, speak to maybe what you consider one of the most relevant and important partnerships you've been able to develop uh, for to advance your work uh, through Save the Elephants. Yeah, you're right. Uh, difficult to pin one specific one because we have uh, partnerships on different fronts, uh, working in different scales with different people. But I would say a long-term partnership with the Kenya Wildlife Service, which is the national uh, mandated organization that deals with wildlife and, and conservation in Kenya. Uh, working with them has been quite helpful because through them, uh, we're able to bring in other partners locally, but also at a, a, a regional level in some aspects. So uh, that, that collaborative front with Kenya Wildlife Service has been, has been quite uh, significant in, in most of our work. Great, thank you. Uh, Richard Hartung asks, what are some of the technology innovations that you're using to protect elephants beyond the things like drones that have been used recently? Could you tell us a little bit more about some of the use of technology that you're deploying? And I would even extend that 
from the kind of hard tech we might be used to here in the United States to some of the low tech that might be more accessible throughout uh, the throughout the remote parts of Kenya. Right. Um, uh, I think maybe Esther can talk about uh, uh, the modalities of using uh, behind fences. That's a, a very uh, a common non-tech way we've been, we've been uh, uh, applying to manage uh, human elephant conflict. So may, uh, maybe Esther can talk about um, what you're doing Thank down. You, Thank you. Um, yes, behind fences are really, um, you know, it's, it's a great, um, you know, method of keeping elephants away because uh, you know it's um, it's you know it's it's rarely that the elephants can habituate to you know be things um, and so it I feel like it's a high tech because elephants cannot habituate to that and so it's basically by putting a fence uh, just around your farm it's it will continue for longer years keeping elephants away from your farm. Great thank you. Um, I'm keeping an eye on time. We've got time for a few more questions. Helen Lang um, asked if it's hard grazing cattle right now with the current drought. Um, it, it'd be great to maybe hear a little bit of your thoughts uh, for those who, who don't know. Kenya has experienced one of the most significant droughts uh, in recent memory, uh, one of the unfortunate impact of our, our growing unpredictable weather pattern, climate change. But uh, what's going on in the field, what are you seeing and how are animal people and wildlife responding? Um, well, this is really, it's really a difficult time right now because of this drought. So basically what we're seeing is an increase in numbers of uh, death of livestock and, and even wildlife. And as well, an increase in conflict because of the same. So uh, wherever there is, uh, you know, this uh, patchy rains. So whenever it rains in, an area, then all wildlife people and livestock converge in that area, and then that one uh, sort of increases conflict that we are seeing. So, yeah, basically, what we're seeing is an increase in conflict because of drought and lots of deaths uh, as well. And, yeah. and just to add on to that, Gigi, uh, we we also seeing patterns of uh, uh, livestock moving into uh, protected areas. These are we, we always think that these are uh, safe havens for, for wildlife like elephant to be away from community areas, but uh, having livestock in the park because of, of the, the uh, effect of drought means that all the, the wildlife have to come out and where they go is human settlements. And that means, again, uh, intensified conflict and, and more negative interactions between people and, and wildlife. So it's, it's a very uh, dire situation at the moment. Yeah. Our hearts um, go out to all the people of Kenya uh, in this really, really challenging time. So um, I also know a lot of people go out and visit um, visit Kenya. So could you speak a little bit maybe to how sustainable tourism is supporting um, Kenya's wildlife? And I would extend that also to, to Kenya's people. This question comes in from Lee Berg. Oh, that's, that's an interesting one. Um, I could speak to uh, directly the, the effects of, of COVID. Um, as you all know, when, when uh, COVID started, it's like all global travel um, ground to a halt. And that meant uh, areas uh, that were relying on wildlife as, a, as, a, as one of the tourism or, or rather one of the income revenues had to look for other means or had to look for other resources to sustain the activities. So I, I, I would say that, um, in cases where tourism is, is a, an income generator in some of the counties, like the ones with parks in the Mara or some areas in Samburu, there was uh, certainly an effect during COVID because uh, tourism numbers really came down and for uh, conservancies that are also reliant on tourism as an income, there, there was quite a, a lot of adjustment happening and not in a good way because that meant uh, a dip in resources and having to look for alternatives to keep uh, sustain the activities. Uh, for example, conservation. Okay, well, th thank you. I know, I know it's been it's been a challenging year on, on so many different fronts. Uh, I I want to bring this to to a close. I know there are a few more questions about uh, volunteer programs or even uh, uh, reintroduction of elephants or the use of um, of the uh, beehive fences in in Asia. 
Um, some of these questions can be answered in the chat, uh, either in the main chat or in the booth chat for, for Save the Elephants. I encourage uh, all of you to go and, uh, and visit the booth for Save the Elephants, continue those conversations. Today is kind of just an appetizer. It's for you to start those conversations, but by all means, this is not the end. The team at Save the Elephants, from Nancy to Esther to Kennedy and, and everybody else, uh, is happy to engage with you and follow these conversations uh, throughout Expo Week, but also beyond, uh, exchanging by email. And I'm sure they'd love to see you in Kenya at, at some point. So on that note, I want to uh, extend my deepest gratitude really to, um, to the three of you, your whole team, and all the communities that you work with throughout Kenya uh, who find a way to, to coexist with elephants and the rest of the wildlife. Uh, thank you so much from the bottom of our heart for everything that you do, and I hope to see you soon. Thank you, Juju. Thank you. Great. Um, so next, we're we're going to stay with elephants, but we're actually going to travel over to Sabah in Malaysia, uh, where we're going to go on a journey, another journey, with Dr. Farina Offman, who is the founder and director of an organization called Saratu Atai. Uh, Farina was born and raised in Borneo and has committed her life to protecting Bornean elephants. Our good friends at the Houston Zoo actually sponsored Farina's doctoral degree and provided support for her um, extensive leadership training um, over a number of years. I've had the pleasure of, of meeting her in person. She is a very compassionate and effective wildlife conservation leader who is now um, inspiring and mentoring many other young women scientists in her country to pursue wildlife conservation careers. Again, um, please uh, go on this journey with Farina and her team, type in questions um, as the presentation progresses, and I'll see you back here with Farina after our little journey to Sabah. Enjoy. Hi everyone, I am Farina Osman, the founder of Seratu Atai, and you are with me in Sabah, Malaysia, Borneo. Today, I'm going to bring you to Kinabatangan, which is the home of the majestic Bornean elephants. The journey to Kinabatangan will take about seven hours. And while I'm driving, I'm going to share with you the unique features of the Bornean elephants. The forest of Borneo is the home to some impressive wildlife on the planet. The Bornean elephants in particular is one of it. To many, they are known as the Bornean pygmy elephants. However, they can still weigh up to 3 tons and stands over 9 feet high. When I first started observing the elephants in 2006, several female herds were moving together as one big herd. If you are lucky, you will get to see over 100 elephants at one time. Bornean elephant loves water, especially during the scorching heat at Kinabatangan. This is the map of Bornean Island, the third largest island in the world and consists of three countries, Malaysia, Indonesia and Brunei. Unlike the endemic orangutan, which could be found throughout the island of Borneo, the endangered Bornean elephants distribution is limited to the north of Borneo, which is in Sabah and North Kalimantan. When we zoom in closer to Sabah, elephants are only found on the east coast of Sabah. There are three main populations, which is the central Sabah, Lower Kinabatangan and Tabin. Currently, we projected that there are about 1,500 wild elephants roaming in, within and surrounding these ranges. The story behind the existence of Bornean elephants on the Borneo Island has always been something of a mystery. Were they naturally occurred in Borneo? Or were they brought from Java to Sulu and then introduced in Borneo by the king of Sulu as illustrated in the map here? Only the DNA of the Bornean elephant could help us clarify this question. Luckily, we don't have to harm the elephants to get their DNA. We just need to find a fresh elephant poop like this one, which for your information is the biggest elephant poop I have ever seen in my entire career. 
we scrap the outer layer of the poop, especially the slimy bit, put it in the tubes and then bring them to the lab to process and get the DNA. So once the process are done in the lab, we have to analyze the DNA. And what we got is this complicated but important graph. What this graph actually showing us that the Bornean elephant have in fact occurred in Borneo since between 11,000 years to 18,000 years ago. During this period, the seawater level were very shallow that allow the animals to travel via land bridges to different islands including Java, Borneo and Sumatra. We became more excited when our colleague Asien, who is a zoo ecologist, made another remarkable discovery recently. Asien, tell us more about your discovery. Hello, Farina. These are indeed very exciting and very important findings from Nia. And they are surely one of the highlights of discovery in my career as a zoo archaeologist. I still vividly remember the very exciting moments when these unusual specimens were rediscovered in the storage rooms of the museum in Kuching. The specimens, which you can see over here, is part of a cheek tooth from a young elephant. The morphology of the cheek tooth fragments closely resembles that of the Asian elephant, Elephas maximus, but the layer from which it was unearthed was estimated to be around 16,400 to about 10,500 years old, based on carbon-14 dating of nearby archaeological layers. To me, these unique specimens in the collection of the Sarawak Museums clearly show that the Asian elephant was part of the native megafauna of Borneo since at least the late Pleistocene times. So the exact relations between these Sarawak prehistoric elephants and the living ones in Borneo is far from clear. It may be safe for us to say that elephants as a species shared the same habitat with humans in Borneo since prehistoric times. As an important part of the native biodiversity, the species can continue to maintain a healthy forest environment, which is so very crucial to the well-being of all communities by way of providing key ecological services such as clean air, water and resilience to forest fires. Not only that they are genetically unique, but you could also notice that the Bornean elephant has slightly larger ears and longer tails to be compared to the other Asian elephant. That's why now the Bornean elephant is recognized as a subspecies of Asian elephants, which make them one of the highest priority population for Asian elephants conservation. So we finally arrived in Sukau, one of the village along the Kinabatangan River. I want to bring all of you along with me in the river cruise to the area where I saw my first wild burden elephants. So let's go. Assalamualaikum. So we are ready in the boat now and I'm not alone. Uh, with me today are the two members of Seratu Atai. We have at the back there. Hi, I'm Amon. And hi, I'm Achang. So you guys ready? Yes. Shall we? So let's go. Kinabatangan River is about 560 km, the longest river in Sabah. The river provides water supply and fisheries 
to the people in this region and more importantly it sustains one of the world richest ecosystems it is also recognized as sabah's first and malaysian largest ramsar site here is the proboscis monkey which is a long-nosed monkey and endemic to borneo and is found mostly in mangrove forest in kinabatangan the salt water crocodile frequently make themselves visible you might see them feasting on fishes or any small animals it can found in the river. And remember to always pay attention to the fruiting trees. You might see the endemic orangutan picking the fruit like this one. Kinabatangan has changed so much, mostly due to commercial logging activities at the beginning. And most of its lowland rainforest now has been developed to monoculture plantations. So to avoid further habitat degradation and fragmentation, uh, the government has gazetted about 50,000 hectares of land. But most of this land are swampy and not really suitable for people and wildlife. So with limited spaces available, people and biodiversity have to learn how to coexist now. So we are almost reaching Danau Kelinanap, which is an Oxbo lake where I first saw the wild Bornean elephants in 2006. The Oxbo lake is the curved U-shaped lake that exist and are created by the meandering action of a river. Not only the lake is critical breeding areas for many freshwater fish species, but it is also one of elephant favorite resting spots. On that late afternoon, I was with a herd of about 10 elephants. Most of them were female with their calves. These elephants knew I was there, but they looked calm and no signs of stress. So I used this time to get myself familiar with their behavior. So while watching this elephant, suddenly we heard a very loud noise and we suspected that this noise came from a noise cannon. The device is being used to scare off the elephants from coming close to um, people's land. Um, and then this sound has made the babies nervous and then started to agitate the adult female so all these elephants were making so much noise and i was trapped in the middle of this group they ignore me because they were so uh, nervous and tried to look after the members of the herd and then it just came to my mind that these elephants are living in their own natural habitats and it's so hard for them to live peacefully since that day i decided to become the voice uh, of the burden elephants and I want to uh, tell the world the plight of the Bornean elephants that are living in this uh, human-dominated landscape like Kinabatangan. We started by asking one question, which is how does the elephants try to feed themselves in this highly crowded area? We look at their movement, uh, we try to understand their social structure, uh, so I had this wonderful opportunity to follow elephants for several years during my PhD. At the end of the study, uh, we managed to identify elephant hotspots along Kinabatangan uh, so that we can now focus our efforts on trying to protect this area. And we also realized that most of the time, uh, people misunderstood elephant behavior. That's why we are not able to manage uh, the human and elephants conflicts effectively to educate uh, and create awareness among the stakeholders about elephants behavior and ecology uh, we always use uh, four keywords which is beans beans stands for big intelligent nomad and also social since elephants are big they require an enormous amount of food Elephants may spend about 12 to 18 hours a day for feeding and their favorite foods along Kinabatangan are grasses and bamboos. However, the habitat patches that contain these food plants are small and scattered. 
and as a result, elephants have to extend their range now to satisfy their dietary requirement. Right now, elephants are getting used to eat on different parts of all palm trees. The second keyword is I, which is intelligent. So here is Sandy. He is a permanent resident of all palm plantations near Sukau. One day, while trying to cross the oil palm plantation, he has mistakenly touched the electric fence. When he felt a sharp shock after touching the wires, he is supposed to leave this area. But he is so determined to move forward. So what he did was he put his trunk into his mouth. And then slowly, he put his trunk on the other side of the fence to avoid the wires. And he moves slowly forward and starts to cross over the wires without even touching it. In the next example, to show how intelligent elephant is in this particular situation, when the elephant heard the sound of the excavator chopping down the oil palm trunks, they start to come out from their hiding because they know that they are fresh oil palm trees trunk which contain high starch and sugar available for them. So how remarkable is this, right? Because elephants require a huge amount of food, they need a big space to fulfill their needs. Uh, especially the males that eat more than the females so that they can have a bigger body size and good body conditions. Usually, the male elephants, they don't mind to travel uh, further uh, and get more uh, food resources. While the females will look more uh, for the safety and consistent water resources for the family herds. The last keyword is social. Elephant, especially the female, has strong relationship between the members of its group. These two females are Belle and Tess, and both of these elephants help each other to look after their calf. In the risky situation like an attempt to cross the Kinamatangan River, the female elephants which lead the group will make sure that everyone is ready and it is safe for all elephants to cross. So no one is left behind. When the leader sends danger, she made just a very short trumpeting sound and everyone quickly came out from the, the water. Then they try again. This time, they managed to swim peacefully in their own group to the other side of the river. The biggest challenges for the elephant population that live in this kind of landscape is that there are many barriers to their movement. Um, they, when they are stuck, in certain area for a longer time, for example, near the village or any monoculture plantation, then there are higher chances a conflict situation can happen. In 2018, uh, we established Serato Atai. Uh, Serato Atai means solidarity because it's time for everyone to play uh, their role and the responsibility to ensure the survival of uh, elephants in Borneo. Our team are now consists of 11 uh, members who are all Malaysians. To achieve our visions, uh, we are focusing our efforts in three main components. Uh, first, research. We continue to try to understand elephants' behaviour and ecology, especially when they are living outside the protected area. And secondly, we try to engage with uh, the community, with the industry players, so that we can come up with the best uh, management plan to reduce human and elephant conflicts. And finally, we try to educate wider public people about the plight of the Bonian elephants, not only in Sabah, but also internationally. Thank you everyone so much for listening. We hope that you already learned a little bit uh, about the plight of the Bonian elephants and the importance to conserve them. Please do share with your uh, family members and your friends. If you want to know more about Stratu Atai and our activities and progress and just to support us, please do come and visit our websites and check out our 
uh, Facebook and Twitter. I look forward to answer any questions and to share more stories with you in the future. Thank you so much again WCN for this opportunity and I hope to see you again in the future. Well, uh, thank you so much, um, Farina and, and your whole team for taking us on this journey. We now have the pleasure of being joined live by Dr. Farina Offman, who is the founder and director of Seratu Atai and, and just took us on this incredible journey um, throughout, uh, throughout Sabah. So welcome, Farina. Thank you, GJ. Hi, everyone. <laughs> um, we're going to have... Um, a bit of time to uh, to follow up with some uh, some questions and a, a discussion here. So I encourage our audience to uh, to be putting questions up in the chat or in the in the Q and A area, and we'll pick them up and uh, and ask them for you. But let me start with just um, asking you, how did you get started? Uh, where where did this passion for for elephants uh, come from? Um. Well, okay. So I think it's it's really like a destiny for me. <laughs> I think we kind of choose each other because uh, every time I try to stop working with them, there is always opportunity to to, to uh, you know work with with this amazing uh, animal. So for I like I say in the video, the first time I saw them, I feel it's very unfair that a lot of people misunderstood them because they are big doesn't mean that they want to charge or attack what people call people all the time. They usually will retreat back you know they they rather go away from people than uh kind of charge elephants so so that's when i feel that okay i have to um to help them great thank you well maybe I, we can expand that a little bit um mm -hmm. there's a question from cassie uh klein that comes in that would like to know about how uh, oil palm plantations are affecting elephants and what you're doing to help oil palm plantations and elephants uh, coexist. And then we're going to have another question related to these uh, elephants going on these palm plantations. But yeah, what's what are the um, interactions between these elephant palm plantations and, and elephants? Mm -hmm. Right. Thank you, Cassie, for the question. So um, Sabah started to develop uh, their uh, kind of our agriculture sector in since 1980s. So that's when, you know, um, at that time, I guess sustainability and conservation is not really something very popular and people uh, care about, you know. At that time, it's about trying to develop the country uh, into, uh, you know, and, and produce some sort of economic um, uh, for our social economic um, uh, development, right? So I guess at that time, we forgot that we are sharing the landscape with, you know, mega fauna like the elephants and other animals as well. So we tend to um, not taking into account the needs uh, of these animals. Uh, but right now, there is no more land that can be at least in Sabah, uh, not the other part of Southeast Asia. Uh, there is no more land to be open and there are a lot of regulations and standards that being uh, put uh, to to the industry so that you know they can uh, better at doing their practices. So right now there are a lot of efforts uh, and the trust are there between conservation field and also the industry. So we could do more now uh, to uh, help each other uh, so that you know we can we can also help uh, our animals friends to to live and survive in this landscape. So th thank you for that. A very couple mm. of questions actually coming up on um, about mm. the elephants going into these fields. Uh, mm. uh, Louise Booth uh, loved the fact that elephants can figure out and get through the electric fence, but she also suspects it, it might be a problem for for humans. And um, and David Fiedler was actually wondering if the workers at the palm plantation tolerated these elephants crossing over the fence. So so what happens once once they're on the other side? What's the interaction between humans and elephants? Yeah, you you are correct because sometimes uh trenches, electric fans, if we put it without a very uh thoughtful plan, it could be a a difficult maze, I would say, for the elephants to 
you know, once they come in and everyone like uh, try to secure their borders with electric fencing, so they will be like a maze of electric fencing. And this is making the, hinder the movement of the elephant. So elephant cannot go, go out again easily. Uh, but uh, again, like we are very lucky because elephants are highly respected. So uh, some people call them uh, Aki or Nene, that means grandmother. So meaning that they are still, uh, people have value and wants to, uh, they are re still respect the elephant. So um, we are trying to take advantage on that and try to uh, using use this opportunity to increase the tolerance by giving them the skills and the knowledge about, you know, elephant sign because before elephant attack or charge you, they will show a lot of signs that they are not happy, they are not comfortable. So as a human being who can think and make decision, we have to tolerate and give them space so to avoid accidents. Thank you. Actually, a, a question that came up as well is, are, are these uh, elephants also crop raiding on smaller farms uh, like we've heard they do uh, throughout Africa? Or do mm -hmm. they just feed on these uh, larger oil palm plantations, which um, there might be a high return on investment there, but do they also crop uh, raid on, a, on the smaller farms and affect the livelihood of, of people? Right. So basically, um, the Bornean elephant situation is quite uh, unique than the other Asian elephants like in India or in Sri Lanka, when, where you have, you know, seasonal crops. Uh, you know, you have paddy and then when it's uh, ready to be harvested, then elephant will come. But in Sabah, the oil palm uh, especially is something, it, it, it has no season. So it's, you know, it's it's always there. And and we think that there is um, not such a uh, like crop raiding situation. Most of the area where elephant have to uh, to travel uh, to reach uh, from one forest block to another for forest block, suddenly you have oil palm or in the middle. So somehow they have to, uh, you know, use this area. And um, now, especially after 25 years, as you can see in the video again, you know, that all this chipping happening. So it's like a food festival for elephant. It's very easy food. So elephants are taking advantage on this as well. Um, you... And then, uh -huh. so, sorry, no, go ahead. I didn't mean to interrupt you. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, but again, you know, because male and female, like, like I said, male, they, 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 they are more adventurous for them is high risk, high gain. We don't care, you know, a little bit of risk. Then that's why you see like more conflicts happening because of the male elephants. It's not much of the female, uh, but that might be changed in the future if we don't start to take into account uh, about their needs when we are, you know, uh, change the land use now yeah so that's interesting I think you answered one of the questions that came up but I want to make sure that you address it explicitly from Grady which mm. was whether you think these these palm oil farms and plantations are are the leading driver of human wildlife conflict and habitat loss mm -hmm. on Borneo and I guess mm -hmm. a related question to that from uh, Linda Tapa Beck is whether you think there's been a change in the government's attitude of, of turning as much land as possible into palm plantations to something else Mm. Uh, so the first question is if the oil palm is the main driver, right? Yes. Yeah. So again, uh, different countries have different situation for Sabah. Uh, I think uh, oil palm is, is, is already there and there is there will be no more adding or, you know, like converting the land to oil palm because there is no more land to do this. And we can see that, uh, you know, with the trust that we have, been working together with other NGOs trying to build the trust and uh, the relationship with them, there are more and more uh, plantations that are ready to uh, improve the way they are doing practices. And they um, and I think right now the main driver will be will be the conflicts and because we misunderstood elephant behavior and we want to stop them. So that's why one of the program that we trying to do right now is to shift the way we think about conflicts, you know, and try to increase the tolerance. Uh, what the other question is? Well, Should I think you it? actually answered it about the change in okay. attitude um, because yeah. there's just no more land. We are running out of time, but I do want to ask a handful more questions. Luckily, we've got the break, so we've got a little bit of buffer. But yeah. um, a question that uh, I thought was quite interesting 
uh, I want to see who it came from really is from Della uh, Pitts, who wanted to know if, if you think the efforts that you're um, deploying to, to protect elephants uh, regarding the, the palm oil plantations is also having a positive impact for other endangered species. So what else, what other species are you, are you seeing as being affected by, by the good work of Suratu Atai? Right. So for Suratu Atai currently, because we are uh, just a, a new organization. So right now we are working with uh, only elephants and uh, human and elephant conflict issues, but we have our partners, uh, for example, like Hutan KOCP, who is also one of the partner with uh, WCN. Uh, we are looking uh, because one of the project is trying to build a corridor uh, to connect the oil palm to the wildlife sanctuary. So we are working with like small species, uh, you know, like um, cats and birds and <laughs> different kind of species. Then we try to see that uh, before we create the corridor while we are in the process of creating the corridor and after the corridor exists, does this change the numbers, the diversity and things like that. So, so yeah, I mean, um, I guess that's that could answer the questions. Right, thank you. <laughs> Um, hopefully keeping a, a, an answer pretty short on this, but um, two more question. One is, are you seeing the elephant population uh, increasing, decreasing, is keeping it steady kind of uh, a, a success for you? What's happening mm -hmm. in terms of the elephant population on Sabah? Yeah, so we think that uh, right now we, we it's really, really important to recount, to recalculate the number, the re-estimate the number of elephants. Uh, but for at least Kinabatangan, we, we see a uh, uh, kind of a uh, stable um, situation, uh, you know, with our elephants. Uh, but certainly, um, uh, we are we have to do a new estimation now and then. Hopefully, in the next expo, I can uh, share with you about this. Great. Thank you. And finally, I see a question also that came in is, do Bornean elephants have tusks? Yes, they do. Because we are Asian elephants. <laughs> Thank you so much for uh, answering all of these questions. I know I didn't get through all of them, uh, but Farina, it's always a pleasure to speak with you. Um, it's been a pleasure to go on this journey with you, uh, with the yep. rest of your team. I wish you the, the best of luck. Um, I look forward to hearing more from you and to, uh, to hearing more about these incredible Asian elephants. Uh, Thank for you. Now, I will, you go ahead. Yeah, I, I will be at the booth. So anyone who wants to join us at the booth, just come and join us. You took the <laughs> words right out of my mouth. Uh, <laughs> oh. There are more questions there. And, um, and please join Farina in her booth uh, and, and start this conversation. Uh, you can also continue that on, on email, follow her work on, on social media and support it. So thank you all for, for that. Um, with, uh, with that, we are going to take a, a short break. Um, I encourage you to explore the platform. You could go check out these booths that we've been talking about. Uh, come back here at 9.30. So, well, 9.30 California time. So come back here in uh, 13 minutes uh, to hear about Pampas cats and snow leopards, which will be introduced by my colleague, Kelly Wilson. Uh, again, thank you so much for spending uh, this first hour with us. Take a quick break, and uh, we'll see you back in uh, in a short while. Again, 12 minutes. We'll be here. See you soon.
Wonderful. Hi, everyone. Welcome back from that break. I really hope you were able to hear from both Save the Elephants and Suratu Atai in that last session. They're both doing stunning and important work in the fight to save elephants, and it's a pleasure to have them here with us. My name is Kelly Wilson. I'm the Director of Donor Engagement for the Wildlife Conservation Network, and I'm very excited to be with you here today. Up next, we have an amazing program for you. For you. Most of you may already know that there are seven species of large cats ranging from lions to tigers. But what you may not know is that there are 33 species of small wild cats roaming our planet. Each is more elusive than the next and each has their own special characteristics. Today we are here with the incredible Jim Sanderson who has worked his way through the world of mathematics until he realized that being hot and cold and wet and dry and covered in swamp dust and ash from a nearby fire was going to be a much more exciting career. And he made the switch to working with our world's small wild cats. Many years ago, Jim started the Small Wild Cat Conservation Foundation protect, to protect these 33 species of little known felines. And he's done just that. SWCCF was also one of the very first WCN partners all those many years ago. So we're excited to have Jim here with us today. Uh, one of the things Jim does best is working with students and young entrepreneurial conservationists, such as the ones you're about to meet. SWCCF has made great strides in protecting species many of us may never see, and that's with the help of young people like Cindy Hurtado and Alvarado Garcia of the Pompous Cat Working Group. Cindy started working on tropical forest mammal research in 2012 and has focused on pompous cat research since 2015. In that same year, she founded a Peruvian NGO focused on researching biodiversity and supporting mammal conservation. By 2017, she was awarded the Carlos Ponce Prize in the category of Young Outstanding Professional for her research and conservation initiatives in Northern Peru. Cindy is currently the co-coordinator of the Pompous Cat Working Group while completing a PhD program. Needless to say, she's got a lot on her plate, so we're excited to have her with us today. Alvarado started working on marine mam marine, excuse me, started working on mammal research in tropical forests in 2009 while he was still an undergraduate student. In 2013, he began his path to Pompous Cat Conservation when he discovered a new pompous cat population in northwestern Peru, not something everyone can claim. Alvarado also founded the same organization, but focuses on that mammal conservation while working with local communities. He's currently the co-coordinator of the Pampas Cat Working Group and co-lead of the Peruvian Desert Cat Project. I would now like to turn it over to Cindy and she'll tell you a bit more about these cats. Cindy, take it away. Hi, I'm Jim Sanderson with the Small Wild Cat Conservation Foundation. Thanks for joining me at the October WCN Expo. I'm here in Peru visiting my colleagues Cindy and Alvaro, who are running the Pompous Cat Working Group. Behind me you can see a fire that's burning their habitat here near the ocean. We're very close to the ocean from here. This is critical habitat. These trees are threatened with extinction. They're called algarobo trees. And this fire was intentionally started to harvest these trees. The Park Service is supposed to be working here, but without us being here, there would be far more fires and far more devastation. Let me, let me introduce Cindy Hartado, who's going to talk for the Office Cat Working Group. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining. I will tell you about the Pampas Cat Working Group. Our main aim is to reduce the threats the pampas cats are facing across its distribution. This is a pampas cat, and not many people know this species. So if you've never heard of it, you're not alone. This species is easily recognizable by the three black lines on its front legs. These cats are really small. They usually weigh two kilograms, which is half the size of a regular domestic cat. This species is also really elusive and it can live in extreme places. For example, you can find it in the Andes at altitudes above 4,000 meters, which is roughly about 13,000 feet. At this altitude, many people will have difficulty breathing. Believe me, I know. 
However, this cat has no problem strolling around and hunting in such a place. This cat also lives at the other extreme, at sea level where temperatures can reach above 100 Fahrenheit in the desert. And then again, no problem for this little cat. I know what you're thinking, what an amazing cat. If you thought the Pampas cat only lived in open areas, that's not the case. They also live in the dry forest of Peru and Ecuador. Because this cat has such a big distribution and it can be found in many places, researchers thought that it could actually represent different species. Recently, they found morphological and genetic evidence to support this claim. So now we don't have one Pampas cat species, but five. We're focusing our efforts in Western South America where we found Coca-Cola and Garlepi species. Unfortunately, all of these species suffer many threats. Feral dogs are a threat because they transmit diseases to wild populations. We also found cats that suffer from road kills, habitat loss, fires, as Jim showed, and retaliatory killings. This photo is showing what most Pampas cats face across its distribution. Retaliatory killings are really common. And the story usually goes like this. Pampas cats find easy prey in free-ranging chicken or poorly built enclosures. They go in, kill as many animals, and this is the way they come out. And this is going to be a hard photo to look at. But this is how many Pampas cats end up after killing domestic animals. Fortunately, we have these amazing people, Soila, Marinia, and Patricio, who are part of the Pampas Cat Working Group and who are working to reduce this threat. They work in Peru and Chile and work with rural communities to change the way they keep their animals. So these are poorly built enclosures that they usually find in the field. So now they're trying to change this to this, a better built enclosure with a roof that is preventing cats from going inside. Another threat that we found are that people are keeping these Pampas cat kittens as domestic animals. They're keeping them as pets. So when we talk to these people, what they usually say is the same story. They found the kittens in the wild. They thought they were domestic cats. They kept them. And usually most of them either do not know how to care for them and they die. Or when the cats grows and becomes aggressive, then they give them back to the authorities. The sad part is that most of these kittens do not even reach the authorities. Either they die during transport, they die because people do not know how to care for them. And when they do reach the authorities, then the end of their journey becomes spending their whole life in captivity. So now we partner with the Margarita Zoo to change this, to give these kittens another opportunity to have a second chance. So we're building this enclosure, which will become a rehabilitation enclosure. So where these cats will have the opportunity to learn hunting skills, to learn to fear humans, and hopefully have a second chance to be wild. Most of our members are also working to mitigate other threats. For example, we have here Pedro who's building these road signs. He's trying to alert drivers of potential wildlife crossings and prevent more road kills of Pampas cats. All of our programs and projects work with environmental education. We educate children and adults we show them the importance about pampas cats in the ecosystem and the threats that they're facing. We also have monitoring programs with camera traps 
We're trying to see where the cuts are, if our programs are working or not, and we're trying to see if we actually have an impact. Most of these projects have recently started. So I hope that I got everybody excited about Pampas Cats. These are some of the stories about some of our members. And I would like to thank everyone for your continued support that is helping us protect these little cats. Thank you. Hope you enjoyed Cindy's talk as much as I did. I'm here in Southern Brazil where we're doing a vaccination campaign for cats and dogs in this rural village. Why are we doing this? Well, it turns out that this is a global wildcat hotspot. We have four species of cats shown here, and there are two other species of small cats in this region. Six small cats in one region is a global wildcat hotspot. We're here in this village doing a vaccination campaign because wild cats get diseases from domestic dogs and cats. If we can improve the lives of these working class people, they'll help us conserve the small cats in the region. This is put on, this is being held by the Jaffrey's Cat Working Group. And a lot of the rural people are coming here to get their dogs and cats vaccinated as a result of our campaign. We've carried out these campaigns at many sites around South America and they're very effective. Last month we vaccinated more than 1,200 dogs and cats. Why is this important? Because wild cats can get diseases from domestic dogs and cats. Last week we got a picture of a jaguarundi with mange. These diseases are impact impacting wildlife negatively and we're trying to do something about it. Obviously, we need a lot more help. We've already started. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you guys for that inspiring presentation. Um, I learned a lot about Pampas Cats and I hope the rest of our audience did as well. So we are back now with Dr. Sim Jim Sanderson as well as Cindy Hurtado and Alvaro Garcia, who I uh, unfortunately used the wrong name earlier. Um, one of the things Cindy said to me when we were starting to talk this morning was that we're trying to solve the problems of now, not the problems of the future. And I think that's a really great way to think about things. So I'm going to start off with some Q&A. If you've got questions, please just drop them in the chat and we'd love to chat with you about them. So Cindy Alvarado, Alvaro, <laughs> I want to start with asking you how, what inspired you to get in this line of work? Well, hi, everyone. Thank you, Kelly. And yeah, so um, it's hard to pinpoint, you know, like where exactly I started. But, um, you know, like since I was a little child, I was interested in animals, as most people. I wanted to be a, a veterinarian. Then I decided that, you know, like diseases and, you know, like exams wasn't my thing. So I just went into biology. But then, you know, like as you mentioned earlier, we know so much about the big cats. We don't really know a lot about the smaller cats. I didn't even really know much about campus cats either. Um, so yeah, so it's this lack of knowledge, you know, like and knowing that some of these species are disappearing before we even know, you know, like their their habits. So that's one of the things that got me excited about, you know, like learning what nobody else knows and 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 yeah, and then work towards, you know, like maintaining these species. That's great, Alvaro. Same question. <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, since kids, I also I always love outdoor activities. And the first time that I, one of the first time when I was an undergrad student and that I went to a small mangrove forest next to the desert that may sound kind of weird because mangrove next to the desert is not pretty common. But um, one day I saw uh, a foot print of this uh, a cat footprint on the sand and that moment I I was very excited because I thought is there any wild cat around here or is there a domestic cat because we are close to to rural communities so I managed to get a old fashioned camera traps uh, 
we, with some friends some of the course that we were taking, we set up the camera traps. Unfortunately, just in two days, I think, we got the first Pampas cat picture ever in Northern Peru. So that's what a very excited moment for me. And since that point, I always looking forward to study and protect Pampas cats, Pampas cats in these unknown uh, areas in Northern Peru and Southern Ecuador. Yeah, I can't even imagine what that feeling must have been like to look at those camera trap photos and realize that you found something that you didn't expect to find or maybe expected to find, but we're, you know, confirming that. So yeah, was was this paper photo uh, camera trap that we have to print to, to see the actual photos? So it wasn't the digital one. Yeah. And I think we lost that. Camera. Wow. <laughs> so when I went to, to print the photos, I clearly remember that was the last very photo that we that I saw that was the Pampas cat. So all the 35 photos, there were like uh, Kimball for vultures, just leaves, nothing and the very last was the pampas cat and it was oh yeah it's like my eureka time because you only have 36 you know like films right so yeah only so many friends oh thank god for digital cameras these days <laughs> Jim, i'm going to toss it to you and ask you what keeps you inspired to continue doing this work well i get i definitely it's the network of people that i work with around the world to protect these small wild cats um the the uh, young people that I work with are very enthusiastic. Uh, they're, they're all working hard to mitigate the immediate threats to the cats. Uh, we can't wait until tomorrow uh, to do all the research we want to do. And we're all curious, of course. But if we don't do the conservation first, we're not going to have anything left to study. And, and a lot of these small cats um, are under the, you know, the, the umbrella uh, of um, much larger species that are more charismatic. And uh, they're, they're often disappearing before we even know that they're there. As Alvaro said, uh, it took him a bit of time to figure out that these cats were living along the ocean in, the, in these mangrove uh, that you know, is only a, a 10 meters wide. And then there's desert. How could a cat live there? Now the fox that was living there was, we, we saw the fox, we could observe the fox, but the cat is much more subtle and much more difficult to find. So you see it could be disappearing well and we don't even know. So the young people that I work with all around the world are working so very hard to mitigate the threats to the small wild cats. Uh, you know, 20 years ago, this wasn't the case at all. There were no people. Yeah. Uh, and, and now we have many, many more people interested. And it's all thanks to WCN's financial partners that, that we're making progress. Yeah, we've been, been able to do a lot of really great things, but only thanks to people like the three of you. Um, we have a question from Sarah. Does the pampas cat interact with any other small wild cats? Yes, definitely. The pampas cat has a wide distribution in South America. So its range overlap with, let me think, Margai, Ocelot, Jaguarundi, uh, Tiger Cat, Andean Cats, um, Pumas, and I don't think they overlap with Jaguars. Or, in, I think or maybe in Brazil, the Pantanal ecosystem they also overlap Argent with jaguars. Northern Argentina in Ibera they overlap with Ibera. jaguars. So in with fact, all the pampas cat overlaps with every single wild cat in South America. Oh that's interesting. A little From bit the of the desert in Peru. Yeah it's to really the, interesting. To the Andean cat in the high Andes we get pampas cats. That's great. Yeah, if we could, if, however, if we consider, you know, like the new, the new split, right? Because, uh, you know, like we used to consider them just one species and we all recognize the pampas cat by, you know, like its diagnostic characteristics. But if we, you know, like if we go into the different species, then, then they only overlap with a couple, right? Like the one in Brazil, which is the one that is most in danger now then that only overlaps with a couple of species and it doesn't overlap with the Andean cat. However, the, the species that we do have in Peru that overlaps in with Andean cats as well, but then also with 
with a couple of small cats. So it really depends. And we are now considering different species because their populations in some of these species are declining. So yeah, yeah it's a complex uh, response. But yeah, if you if you think about, you know, just the pampas cats of, at large, they are amazing and they overlap with with many cats as well. What we're what we're looking at, Sarah, is that in the past the pampas cat group was considered to be one species. Now with the new molecular techniques, with the with the knowing its habitat, also clearly looking at it, uh, the pampas cat is definitely five different species. And when we create those five different species, uh, then they won't. None of them will overlap with um, all the cats of South America. They'll be split up into different regions. And as a consequence of that, we'll have well, one new species that will be critically endangered and it will become the most endangered cat in the Americas with an estimated total population of less than 200 individuals. So that's what we're looking at. Wow. And it's important to recognize that that's a separate species yeah. that needs immediate attention. And yeah. Cindy and Alvaro are leading that effort for the Pampas Cat Working Group. Thank you guys for that. Um, kind of changing to the biology a little bit, what is their major food source? Um, yeah, you're not muted. <laughs> OK, uh, Pampas Cat mainly prey on rodents, uh, small birds, some lizards, and in the Andes, they mainly feed on biscachas, that is like a rabbit type. Yeah. So, but they pray, they also can prey, unfortunately, on poultry. So when, that's when conflict with rural people happens. So in retaliation, uh, the people kill the cats. So we are also trying to, to avoid that, that threat by providing them better or improve their fences. You're looking at a cat that weighs no more than six pounds. Tiny. So you guys were saying that one of the challenges is that people bring them home as pets and think that they're kittens and have them, but then they don't survive as well. What is the sort of morphological differences between a pampas cat and a house cat that makes it so hard to keep them alive in captivity? Even though we don't want yeah. to having them as pets. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, it's it's, it's, a, it's a good question. And 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 for us it's it's really easy to see, you know, like a cat and say, okay, this is a pampas cat, this is a domestic cat, right? But yeah, but not true. regular people or like the general public who's who are not used to looking at pampas cat, they don't really know, right? But so you know like they always will have the same markings on their face. So Pampas cat, when their kittens do not change, you know, like if you have a domestic cat, it could be with different colors, different, vary a, a lot, right? Then when you have kittens, then they have their mom, right? Like if you have a domestic cat and that diet, you know, like feeding them, that's that's what it's really challenging. Even in, in zoos, because Pampas cats are not really well represented in zoos, so not, not many zoos, in South America have pampas cats. So the care, you know, like they need specific, you know, like amount of protein, then, then you know, like people give them milk, you know, like just just whatever milk that we drink and that that's like kittens cannot digest this milk. So so then, then it becomes a problem, right? Um, if you have, you know, like a domestic cat, it's easy because the mom is there usually, but this is not the case for the little kittens. And then um, they're really vulnerable, right? Like if you put them in a place where they can fall, you know, like they're really fragile as well. So that's that's something that we need to consider. And even in zoos, you know, like you need to pay special attention. They're like tiny babies, right? And and this is something that people don't really think about. And, and that's why they end up dying. There's a fundamental difference that we don't see. And that is all cats have 19 pairs of chromosomes. But the mm -hmm. pompous cat and the genus that it's in have 18 pairs of chromosomes. So they're very different. They have a different genetic makeup than all other cats. Okay, learn something new every day for sure. Especially well, you don't today. see that, of course. Right, but still it's fascinating. Um, Jim, Shawnee is asking, do you have a favorite cat and why? Hi, Shawnee, it's great to hear from you. I'm gonna miss you at Expo. 
but we must get together over a Zoom. Thanks for your question. Well, it depends on where I am. So, you know, if I'm in the high Andes of Chile, there's the Garlepi, the pompous cat is a beautiful cat. But of course, I like the Indian cat too. And then in Borneo, well, you know, there's the flat-headed cat. But then, uh, you know, there's also the bay cat and the marble cat. And, um, you know, in Africa, the little black-footed cat is really interesting. Uh, but in the Sahara, there's the sand cat. So where, I think wherever I am, that's my favorite cat. And right here in New Mexico, my favorite cat is the bobcat. <laughs> Although I, you know, I'm on the board of the Mountain Lion Foundation. So I should say, you know, mountain lions <laughs> are also beautiful. Uh, but I, 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 I guess I like them all, Shawnee. I, Hard to pick. Cindy Alvaro, do you have a favorite? Well, I think it's it's pretty obvious. <laughs> yeah, we're biased. We're biased. I think you know, like I I love most cats, like all of them. Usually, I love the most that I have a, a chance to interact with, and I think that's really important. You know, like people probably don't care about the campus cat because they never interacted with it. They don't even know it exists. So I think information is important. So the more I learn about a cat, the more I love it. So yeah, so I, I love the pampas cats, of course, but then, you know, like Margais ocelots are really beautiful and they have so many incredible characteristics and, and you know, like the way they climb. So yeah, so each each cat has its unique, you know, like identity and, and yeah, I love them all, <laughs> but pampas cats, it's a little- It's fair to say that the small cats add diversity to the family of cats. You know, we have no big cat that lives in a desert like a sand cat. Yeah. We have no big cat that's nearly as arboreal as a margay or a, or a marbled cat. Yeah. And we have, you know, no cat, no big cat lives in the desert um, mangrove of, of Peru. It's the yeah. pompous cat. So the, the yeah. small cats really add uh, a lot of diversity to the family of cats. Yeah, for sure. Uh, Deanna is actually asking which one is most endangered or is there one that's most endangered? Um, most cat specialists um, agree that the flat-headed cat that occupies Sumatra and Borneo, um, as was you've seen pictures uh, uh, from Saba, uh, that flat-headed cat is the most threatened cat in the world. And the reason is palm oil plantations uh, and ha ha just habitat loss. Yeah. So Malaysia and, and, and Indonesia are dedicated to becoming the world's largest oil palm producers. They'll stop at nothing to do it. And the habitat of the, of the uh, flat-headed cat is peat swamp forest that is drained and most easily converted to oil palm plantation. So yeah. in that Kitapatangan area where you saw the elephants, there are also flat-headed cats, but they're far, far, far more rare. You see yeah. one and you'll never see one again. I've seen the elephant swimming across the Kitipatangan River, but I, I never saw a flat-headed cat and I never mm -hmm. saw a camera trap picture of a flat-headed cat there until a few weeks ago. Well, those cats tend to, to like to hide out. Um, Angeline Siegel is asking, can you give us an idea of the population numbers of the two groups that you're studying and how you're tracking those population numbers? Getting a handle on these population numbers is incredibly difficult uh, because they're so rare. So, but but um, through the use of camera traps and also genetics, we can attempt to get numbers. Uh, but usually, we use um, you know relative abundances, uh, and we also use camera traps not to get information on populations, but to know whether our impact is making a difference. So we use something called time. What are the threats? What are our interventions? What are our cameras telling us about how well we're doing? Mm -hmm. And then we evaluate what we're doing. To get a handle on population would take almost all of our resources and we'd have to do it again every year. Yeah. Cindy and Alvaro, do you wanna add something to that? Um, yeah, it's as, as, as Jim said, it's really hard to get estimates. Uh, what he was mentioning about camera traps, 
you know, like it's not just the resources that it takes, but it's also that, you know, like sometimes they get stolen, right? So we put, we go through the effort of going there, getting the funding, going there, setting them, and then they, they just vanished uh, pretty quickly. And that happened to many of our partners. So genetic is another option. Uh, we are partnering uh, with uh, universities that do this gen genetic analysis, but it's also costly. And as Jim said, we need, we need repeated samples to see a trend. So yeah, we're as as you mentioned earlier as well. We're trying to focus on threat mitigation. So you know, like the the density or the you know like the population could be you know like stable, declining. But as long as we keep saving cats, you know, like we're making a difference. So that's what we're focusing on. You could you could ask how many mountain lions there are in New Mexico. We have absolutely no idea. You could ask how many domestic cats there are in our nation's capital, Washington D.C. We have no idea. Ask about uh, the number of bobcats in California. We have yeah. absolutely hard. no idea. Populations are, are hard to hard to track. We are pretty much yeah. out of time, but I want to ask one last question of Sandy and Alvaro, and that is, what are your biggest needs right now? How can people help? Well, um, they can help in different ways. Right now, you're helping because you're paying attention to the to the pampas cat to the problems that, that they are facing but we have on our website something called share your talent for example so so if you are an artist and want to make a beautiful pampas cat drawing uh, and put it on social media raise awareness or sell it maybe that is something that could help us also, if you are a designer and you are really good at doing websites, we you can help us building our Pampas Cat working web websites, but we are that we are still in development. So there's many different ways that you go helping us. I don't know, Jean, Cindy, you wanna add something else? Yeah, no, I just compliment that. You know, like I, we know that you know, like we apply for funding, so that's our main source. You know, like of 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 to increase our activities, but then we know that not everybody, you know, like have funds that they can, you know, provide to different conservation groups. So we are trying to give people, you know, like other ways of helping. And yeah, like social media manager, you know, like we spend so much time, you know, like trying to get people to care about campus cats. That could be, you know, like give a little bit of your time towards these conservation projects will will go a long way. So, you know, like just as, as he said, you know, like you are already here, you're trying to support us, you know, like just, you know, like think about something that you're good at and then, you know, like share it with us or with other projects and say, you know, like here's how I can help. And that that's amazing. Like we would love any type of help that we can get. You can visit Pedro's, Great. Thank you can visit Pedro's B&B &B and see his pompous cats there. Yeah, <laughs> that's, yeah, nice. There. Go. Get to their field. Get out there and see these animals. Um, well, I hope everyone out there has enjoyed this conversation as much as I have. I've definitely learned some new things and gained some some further inspiration about these wonderful little creatures. Um, Cindy, Alvaro, Jim, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Kelly. Uh, if your question didn't yeah. get answered, these guys are going to hop over to their booth. Oh, yeah. Uh, they're going to hop over to their booth so you can ask some questions there. Of course, your support is critical to ensuring these cats will be here well into the future. Um, and I just want to say thank you to everyone out there for all you do for the world's wildlife. We're going to switch gears now and start talking about Thanks snow to everyone for joining. And go from small cats to big cats. Thank you. Great. Um, okay. So we're shifting gears from the small wild cats of the world to one of the most majestic large cats. Uh, for those of you just tuning in, my name is Kelly Wilson. I'm the Director of Donor Engagement for the Wildlife Conservation Network, and I'm very excited to be with you today. Uh, Snow Leopard Conservancy was founded by the magical Dr. Rodney Jackson and Darla Hillard many years ago and is also one of the first WCN partners. Today, to lead us on a journey through the Himalayas, we have the new executive director of the Snow Leopard Conservancy, Ashley Lutz Nelson. Ashley is incredible at building collaboration between ex situ and in situ wildcat conservation entities, and she uses that skill to support those on the ground working with local communities. 
The positive energy and warmth Ashley brings to every situation is incredible in showing each one of the partners supported by the Snow Leopard Conservancy that they're not alone in saving snow leopards and that they have the backing of those of us across the world and that their work is valued and important. In her talk, Ashley will also feature many of the Snow Leopard Conservancy partners, such as Rinzin Lama, who you may have met somewhere along the line. The wonderful community organizers making great strides for snow leopards across their range. Ashley, over to you. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. And thank you to the WCN team for hosting this wonderful expo, bringing us together to talk about the protection of many incredible species. Snow Leopard Conservancy was one of WCN's early partners 20 years ago. And I want to thank WCN and to each of you for your support in helping grow Snow Leopard Conservancy into what we are today with over 18 partners in seven different Snow Leopard range countries. Over the course of this talk, I will give you a brief introduction to this amazing feline and highlight our current work with our local partners, which is helping snow leopards, mountain communities, and other animals sharing their home to coexist and thrive. Let's begin. Ghost of the Mountains, Queen of the Mountains. These nicknames describe the majestic and elusive nature of the snow leopard. Mystical and sacred, snow leopards are a totem species to indigenous communities sharing this magnificent landscape. They are the apex predator of this harsh, rugged, high mountain ecosystem of Asia that expands across several mountain ranges in 12 different countries. I'm delighted to share with you the stories of our partners and programs in the Nepalese Himalaya as pictured in this gorgeous video by Tashi Gali in Manam, Annapurna. This is a vital ecosystem that provides fresh, precious glacial water for hundreds of millions of people living downstream in Central, South, and East Asia. The main prey of snow leopards are blue sheep who are also well adapted to living in this high mountain ecosystem. Snow leopards are motivated by searching for this agile herbivore across steep ridges and valleys in their vast home ranges. For female snow leopards, this could be approximately the size of the city of San Francisco, while males could range up to two to three times this size home range. Traditional herding communities also share this high altitude landscape, utilizing domestic livestock, such as horses and mules, as you see in this video, for transportation of food and goods, which could be a several days walk from the nearest road access. Goats, sheep, and yak are also utilized for milk, meat, and wool products. Unprotected livestock, however, can make easy prey targets for snow leopards, leading to conflict with the herders and retaliation against the cat to reduce the threat to the herder's primary livelihood. With only approximately 3,000 to 7,000 individual snow leopards in the wild, they are classified as vulnerable by IUCN and endangered within most of the each within each of the snow leopard range countries. Snow leopards face many other threats to their existence, include, in addition to human wildlife conflict, including poaching, disease, habitat degradation due to mining and other resource extraction. Climate change is a huge factor, which is first seen in these mountain landscapes and a general lack of awareness of their importance in the ecosystem. Our work centers around solutions, facilitating solutions that protect snow leopards. We help mountain communities, so these big cats go from being viewed as a pest and being retaliated against to being protected, being prioritized, and even revered as a critical component of this interconnected ecosystem. So let's take a trip over to Asia from San Francisco so we can get a better look of what it's like. The snow leopards range vast from the north part of Russia and the Altai Mountains down to the Hindu Kush Himalaya in the south. 
As we zoom in, we take a closer look in Nepal at the different snow leopard landscapes where our partners are working on community-based conservation and education initiatives. From Kachinjunga in the eastern Nepal, which is a corridor between Bhutan and Nepal, to Sagarmatha National Park, which is home to world's highest peak, Mount Everest, over to Annapurna Conservation Area in central Nepal, where we've been working in the Mustang and Manang district for many decades, for several decades, over to Shea Fuxindo National Park, where our founder, Dr. Rodney Jackson, did his initial studies on snow leopards. Over to the Humla district in the most western part of central of most western part of Nepal, where Rinsen Funjuk Lama is working to protect snow leopards and other biodiversity in his hometown, home district of Humla. It's my pleasure to first introduce Rinsen Funjuk Lama of Humla. Rinsen received a Sydney Byers Scholarship from WCN in 2015 for his graduate work in biodiversity conservation, which included studying snow leopards. Since earning his graduate degree, Rinsen is becoming a local conservation leader while also recognizing gaining international recognition for his dedication and career as a leading wildlife conservationist in Nepal. This included receiving the prestigious Rolex Award in 2021. And with this award, Rinson has been able to launch a comprehensive community-based conservation initiative in the Upper Kanali landscape. In Nepal, we grew up with a culture that is about love, compassion, and action. This philosophy is something very profound in remote areas. It's about balance between humans and nature. I'm Rinjin Funjok Lama. Every day I work with the local communities in the remote Nepal so that we can protect unique mountain environments. The pressure on wildlife is increasing more than before. Definitely there's a impact of climate change in terms of rainfall and snowfall. Human encroachment into the habitat, the illegal hunting, these are constantly putting pressure on the wildlife and the habitat. No leopard. Female or young juvenile, 38, 50 meters. We aim to document what we have in terms of biodiversity. It can be plants, animals, birds. This helps us identify the priority areas with a goal to protect what we have and to restore the declining populations. The working season is very short and we have to cover a vast landscape. My area, Humla, is almost 6,000 square kilometer and I'm the first environmental graduate. So by default, I'm becoming the first conservationist. Humla covers the largest non-protected landscape in Nepal and offers habitat for some of the most threatened species in the world. <laughs> In the remote mountains, livelihood has always been the priority. For example, livestock has been being one of the primary source of livelihood. When you have a livestock get killed by some carnivore, like a snow leopard, or wolf, or jackal, people suffer huge loss. They kill the culprit animal. There has to be balance between wildlife conservation and the community needs. The first thing is we need trust that we are doing something good for local communities. They have to be empowered to take part in the process. I see a similar culture, same religion. This is something that really helps. The Rolex Award is that component that helps me with the long-term vision. We have a plan to support the communities with livelihood diversification and also build predator-proof corral and light deterrent devices. If you want to bring change, you have to start from yourself first. But at a large scale, alone, I cannot do anything. We are doing a school eco class. We will mentor them. We will try to produce a student who is interested to pursue their careers in the field of environment conservation. In life, one should have a passion and a feeling of adventure. I really want to follow my passions, and that is what my work offers me every day. Hello everyone, 
Namaste. I'm Rinin Punjok Lama. Right now I'm speaking from Simikot, Humla, where my main project office is. With the support from Rolex Award for Enterprise in 2021. So the main goal of the project is to strengthen community-based biodiversity conservation in Upper Karnali landscape. So it's also the upper catchment of the Karnali River. This project primarily uh, focus on uh, five main component biodiversity documentation and monitoring uh, community based uh, conservation education and awareness raising capacity building to train uh, to promote as a local citizen scientist and to support livelihood enterprises uh, to uh, with the aim of diversifying livelihood sources it's been uh, almost 6 months of our project implementation we have accomplished quite few things uh, we completed the board survey uh, right now our herpeter fauna survey is going on so the, our uh, school level eco club formation with the aim of uh, raising awareness about uh, environment conservation as well as uh, raising interest uh, in the field of uh, environment and biodiversity conservation uh, with the school children. So we have established uh, six clubs in six different government schools in Humla, in Upper Humla. We completed uh, several phases of uh, capacity building training. Uh, especially for the local communities. The most awaited uh, snow leopard and spray survey is uh, going to happen soon. So we are preparing uh, for that at the moment. These are uh, some of the things that we we have been doing so far. And I want to thank Rolex Award for Enterprise uh, for uh, Snow Leopard Conservancy and WCN for supporting our work uh, in Nepal. Thank you. Namaste, Rinsen and Tashi with Third Pole Conservancy for all you are doing to protect snow leopards, biodiversity by working with communities in the Upper Kanali landscape and in the Manang district of Annapurna Conservation Area. Next, it's my pleasure to introduce you to our partner, Shearing Lamu Lama, which pictured here with her adorable son, Sansei. A former Snow Leopard Junior Ranger, Shearing has become a leading independent Snow Leopard conservationist in her hometown of Dalpa, just outside Shafuxendo National Park. Dalpa is located in a prime Snow Leopard habitat between ridgelines where Snow Leopards frequently pass through. There have been multiple retaliatory killings of snow leopards here prior to shearing starting to work here with the villagers on solutions that will prevent conflict while improving the lives of herders and change their attitudes towards snow leopards. Shearing and her sister Sonan have been working as a team in Dalpa to better understand the level of livestock depredation and attitudes towards snow leopards and other wildlife. By hosting appreciative participatory planning and action meetings with the villages, Searing and Sonam have discussed conservation solutions that can benefit the community on protecting their livestock. Herders have received and are trained on the use of fox lights, which are low cost predator deterrents that emit a random light pattern up to a one kilometer away. These lights are working to in different Snow Leopard Conservancy program sites to deter snow leopards from attacking livestock. Dr. Jackson has been mentoring Shearing over the last couple of years, and just this last spring, he was able to work with her in Dalpo on working with herders on identifying improvements to corrals and guarding practices that protect herders' livestock. Searing and Sonam are well respected within their communities and have made incredible progress in just a short time, getting critical relief to herders and saving the lives of endangered snow leopards. As traditional herding practices are passed down generation to generation, cost-effective techniques that reduce depredation can improve not only economic status, but improve human well-being and opportunities, and over time can change the perception of snow leopards and helping the communities coexist with this cat. Local leaders like Shearing can also inspire other women in her community to take a role in conservation and inspire the next generation of conservationists. While also protecting the next generation of snow leopards. We are seeing a shift towards coexistence in sites where we have been working for, for several years, such as in the remote Narfu Valley of Annapurna. Snow Leopard Conservancy and Mountain Spirit have been working with the Nar and Fu Valley communities on a comprehensive snow leopard initiative under a Darwin Initiative grant with the goal of sustaining snow leopard conservation through strengthened local institutions and enterprises. 
with the overarching goal of protecting this critical landscape that is near the Tibetan border and home to approximately 20 to 40 snow leopards, which is a significant portion of the population in Nepal, which is only up to about 350 individual cats. Over the pandemic, the herding communities lost critical incomes from the evaporation of ecotourism due to restrictions associated with travel. This made their livestock even more valuable to their livelihood and survival. And it also unfortunately intensified the threat of conflict and subsequent retaliation towards snow leopards when depredation happens. We were able to work with the local municipality on adapting Darwin Initiative program activities to include critical support to address food and medical scarcity, providing fox light, deterrence to protect high valued yaks and provide essential equipment to assist the Naranfu communities during the natural disasters such as flooding and landslides that occurred during 2021 as well. With the support of WCN's emergency relief funds, we were able to facilitate the development of a new livelihood opportunity associated with snow leopard conservation. This include restoring a delicious native Himalayan chive called Jimbu that is highly valued in markets locally as well as in Kathmandu. This gave the communities tangible hope for new alternative incomes with the support of co-financing from their local government. These activities help to build a good foundational relationship with these communities and rural municipality leaders. The significance of this came into play when a snow leopard was seen in the area in the, in the food community a couple of days prior to one evening this last spring, when it came down from adjacent ridgeline and gaining access to a corral and killed, unfortunately, the entire herd of 44 goats contained in an unsecured traditional stonewalled enclosure. The family was understandably distraught from the severe economical and emotional hardship of what is, this, what is called a surplus killing, which was compounded on top of the challenges of the pandemic. Fortunately, Kamal Tapa was in the village working on a blue sheep survey for the Darwin Initiative at the time and was able to work with local wildlife officials from Annapurna to facilitate the safe release of the snow leopard who was stuck in the corral over the course of 24 hours. The local municipality was able to work with the local wildlife officials to expedite the compensation relief for the devastating loss of the entire herd to ensure commitment and support to the families within the food community that suffered the losses. The forgiveness shown toward the snow leopard by the community members is a significant shift toward positive, compassionate coexistence with the big cat. By improving the well being of local people living with snow leopards, we can improve the protection of snow leopards. This last spring, we launched a collaborative One Health veterinary pilot program in these two communities, which had been delayed for over two years due to the onset of the pandemic and associated travel restrictions. This partnership in collaboration with Inter International Veterinary Outreach, Mountain Spirit, and San Francisco Zoo, all nonprofit organizations, our veterinary team hosted animal health and conservation workshops for herders in both communities. Our collaborative team included International Veterinary Outreach founder, Dr. Eric Eisenman, and Nepal program Darwin Initiative manager, Dr. Sedlandra Jakali from Mountain Spirit. And we were joined by leaders of the local municipality, Snow Leopard Conservation Committee within the community, and local livestock department representatives on this panel. And we were excited to see an excellent turnout of herders, both men and women that were interested in learning more about One Health. We covered a range of topics, which included introducing One Health concepts, which is the interdependence of human health, animal health, and environmental health. We discussed the parallels to Tibetan Buddhism beliefs, and one of the main goals of this program is to reduce the risk of transmitting diseases between people, domestic animals, and wildlife. Our team discussed livestock health and mortality concerns with the herders going over surveys from the pre-assessment results our partners had obtained ahead of time. 
and we are able to reinforce vaccination and treatment options that are currently available to them through their local municipalities, livestock department representatives. Our team discussed humane, the humane treatment of livestock through improved husbandry and care to ensure that they have the knowledge to meet their animals' basic welfare needs. This included supportive treatment through oral rehydration salts for gastrointestinal issues and wound bandaging, wound cleaning and bandaging for minor or non-lethal attacks from snow leopards and other predators such as wolves or jackals. Understanding compassionate care and improving the relationships with the herders and their domestic animals can help build compassion for wildlife and improve this relationship with them as well. We hope the workshops will be helpful to the communities in promoting better health, conservation practices, and also facilitating collaboration between local institutions that can benefit both people and animals. We want to ensure that herders and livestock can live more peacefully with snow leopards through practical and sustainable conservation measures. We also met with the Narpa Bumi municipality leaders to discuss the workshops and future collaboration after four years of working together under the Darwin Initiative. The municipality's crest includes a snow leopard and a blue sheep, as well as other unique attributes, which are indicative of the pride of their local heritage, wildlife, and unique offerings to their broader global community. Our collective accomplishments working together over the last several years has led to a sound relationship with the communities and the municipality where conservation, where the conservation, where conservation for the benefit of people, snow leopards, and wildlife is prioritized. As I begin to lead Snow Leopard Conservancy into its next chapter, I would like to thank our founders, Dr. Rodney Jackson and Darla Hillard, for their pioneering efforts over the last four years on groundbreaking community-based conservation education initiatives. Their vision of harmonious coexistence between snow leopards and mountain communities is becoming a reality through their dedication and commitment to conservation that is inclusive, values-driven, locally driven, and very practical. From initiating the first scientific studies, which led to the understanding of snow leopard diet, behavior, range, working alongside local partners, to creating pathways for the involvement of indigenous cultural practitioners in snow leopard conservation. This has empowered indigenous voices and traditional ecological knowledge in the greater conservation and scientific community. And I want to thank them for their long-term support for partners like Anil Hadakari and the Land of the Snow Leopard coordinators for creating environmental education opportunities that has led to the increase, which has led to increasing the understanding of the importance of snow leopards and the importance of culture and spirituality in conservation. This inspires pride and action for the preservation of their unique and magnificent biodiversity and traditions. And finally, I want to thank Rodney and Darla for their dedication to mentoring so many of the next generation of conservation practitioners, which has laid the foundation for snow leopard conservation to reach new heights under local leadership and community guardianship. It is through welfare, education, health, and conservation initiatives that value all the components of the ecosystem that we can help build compassionate coexistence and sustainability for both people and animals in this shared mountain ecosystem. I find inspiration in each of our partners and the dedication and determination of these mountain communities and the resiliency of snow leopards and for each of you for your individual contributions. Thank you so, so very much. I hope you all are well, and I wish you all the very best. Thank you so much for your time today. Great, I hope that was, um, I hope that you enjoyed learning about snow leopards and what it takes to save them. The people making that happen as much as I did. It was wonderful to yeah. see Rinzen and the work happening on the ground and great to hear about the bigger picture from Ashley. So with me here is Ashley, who's the executive director of the Snow Leopard Conservancy. Hey, everybody. 
and the great Rod Jackson, the founder and president of SLC. Let's uh, hop on to some of these questions that have been coming in in the chat. And just a reminder for those of you out there, if you have questions, please drop them in the chat. And we'll do our best to get to them. Um, so a question from Tammy is, does saving this species all come down to changing people's attitudes? Ashley, maybe you can speak to that. Yeah, that's a great question. Thank you, Tammy. You know, it largely does. Our work hugely centers around mitigating, you know, human wildlife conflict for the species so that these mountain communities can become the frontline guardians of the species. There are a lot of challenges with climate change that we're seeing the effects in the mountains. It's one of the first places you start to see the effects of climate change and um, with loss of prey and competition over domestic livestock, there are definitely significant challenges. But if we can create communities that are snow leopard friendly and um, you know, find ways to improve the sustainability efforts for them, then they will become the guardians over snow leopards. So that's our, our focus. That's great. Um, a question from Brooke is why are snow leopards poached? Is it for subsistence? Is it body parts? Is it illegal wildlife trade? Retaliation? Yeah, Rodney, you want to take that one? Okay, sure. Well, thank you for that question. Yeah, I th there's several reasons, but the primary one is because snow leopards are threatening the economic livelihoods of local people who are entirely dependent on animal husbandry. And when a cat gets into a nighttime pen, the livestock cannot escape, the cat can get in easily, and it goes on a killing spree. So, you know, people really see snow leopards as pests. And our goal, as Ashley has so nicely indicated, and Renzen, is to mm -hmm. change that paradigm from people seeing it as a pest to people seeing it as, as an asset. And if we can prevent the depredation losses, we go a long way towards meeting that goal. For sure, for sure. Rod, um, Richard's asking, are the lights the main way to protect the domestic animals? And what other strategies are you using? I think one of the most important strategies that we are in the process of strengthening that I think is going to become really the lead one and that is to give people alternatives or options for income generation mm -hmm. uh, we know from Ladakh for example if uh, tourism is an opportunity out there and people have a chance of seeing a snow but as they do here every group that we sent have seen cats in mm -hmm. only 10 days it really changes everything people give up most of their livestock that are just decimating the landscape and leaving little food for the blue sheep and instead of getting more income from uh, homestays and, and just tourist visits, guiding and so on. So I think this is really gonna be the future as well as other simple jobs to reduce the amount of outward migration from these re remote communities into the urban centers where life is so much more difficult. Yeah, for sure. Uh, we have young Rory Adams who's asking, what are some ways for young wildlife supporters like me to help snow leopards? That's a great question. Thank you for joining us today, Rory. This, you know, conservation really takes us all. You know, we really, everybody's unique skill sets. Um, we can all get involved, whatever you're good at, whatever you're passionate about. Um, and whichever species or area that you feel strongly um, you know, passionate about, um, we could use everybody, you know, it's really going to take a team to, to accomplish some of these major goals. So um, feel free to reach out to us. We have all sorts of ways that you could help out and we'd love to hear from you. I always say, do whatever you do best and apply it yeah. to wildlife, you know, if you're exactly. be a wildlife accountant, anything you want to yeah. do and apply it to wildlife. Yes, exactly. um, I would quickly what? add into that network, you know, spread the word. Yeah. That's one yeah. of the most valuable things you could do. And, right. and reach out to others and create, you know, conservation communities. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Um, kind of, I think we've got time for one last question here. So I want to make sure that we ask, what is the biggest need for snow leopards currently? And if you had unlimited funds, what would you tackle? <laughs> Yeah, so 
As far as you know, spreading the awareness, and we could always use funding to expand our programs. We are really looking at what is going to make the most impactful thing in snow leopard habitat. So we can't work in every single community. Our partners cannot work in every single community, but if they can learn from each other and to get the municipalities talking to each other and learning on, there's really no one size fits all formula for each community and they will, but by learning from each other, what's successful and bringing network of conservationists together to learn from each other and build collaboration and uh, feel supported by one another, then, you know, I really feel that if we can target our funds towards facilitation of those measures and capacity building and training and building our and empowering local leaders um, to keep these programs growing and expanding, then that's really going to be the key to saving snow leopards long term. Great. Rod, anything to add to that? Yeah, I think from my side, as I move into semi retirement, it's uh, mentoring the next generation and it's finding those passionate young conservationists that live in these villages or have uh, come from them originally to be the spokesperson and the guides and for us to provide technical support, knowledge, know-how, as well as some seed funding uh, mm -hmm. so that they can work with local government. And you know, you can get different players coming into the picture, contributing according to, to their resources for a, a solution that is everybody's solution or everybody's involved in it, we would hope. Yeah, just like Shearing and Rinson um, that were featured in presentation. And they wish they could be here today, but this is prime time to be out in the field saving snow leopards. So uh, we're very happy to answer questions on everybody's behalf. And thank you so much, Kelly, the whole WCN team yeah. and everybody for joining us today. We'll see you in the booth. And thank Great. you all for the support that you provide. Yeah. Thank you both. Um, really glad to have you here today. As Ashley just said, they're going to pop over to their expo booth so you can meet them over there, learn more about snow leopards, ask some of those questions that maybe we didn't get to. Um, of course, like I said, your support is critical in helping these programs be successful. So we thank you for that. And we thank you for all you do to save the world's wildlife. Next up, we have about a 10 minute break and then we're back at a quarter till the hour to hear about thiagas and giraffes, possibly two of the most interesting uh, looking ungulates on our planet. So looking forward to hearing about those two species. Don't forget to check out the booths and we'll see you later. Thanks so much.
Hello, everyone. I hope you were having a wonderful time learning from and connecting with the amazing conservationists joining us here at Expo today. My name is Laura Gruber. I'm a senior programs manager with WCN, and I'm thrilled to introduce you to a few more inspiring conservationists. The Sayaga Conservation Alliance protects the incredibly unique Sayaga antelope. Found in the steppe and semi-arid deserts of Central Asia and Russia, the Sayaga population dwindled from millions to just the few hundred thousand surviving today. The Saiga Conservation Alliance protects this unique species throughout their range. I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Elena Baikova, Program Director for Uzbekistan and co-founder of Saiga Conservation Alliance, and Olya Esapova, Research and Development Officer of the Saiga Conservation Alliance. Dr. Elena has over 25 years of experience as a field zoologist. She's been actively involved in Saiga conservation in Uzbekistan since 2004. Much of her time is dedicated to encouraging community engagement in Saiga conservation and involving government agencies to support sustainable and long-term Saiga ecosystem protection. Olya became a formal member of Saiga Conservation Alliance in 2017, where she works with local communities to protect the critically endangered Saiga antelope. Olya is a founding member of Youth for Wildlife Conservation, has received a Young Conservationist Leadership Award, and is an alumni of the Emerging Wildlife Conservation Leaders Program. Elena and Olya, please take it away. Hello from Uzbekistan. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining our presentation today. Um, we are here in Karakal, Pakistan, which is a part of Uzbekistan. It's like autonomous republic. Um, and behind us, uh, by the way, you can see the national flags from this area. My name is Yelena. And my name is Olya. And we present here Cyber Conservation Alliance. Uh, here we are to protect critically endangered saiga antelope and their habitat. Um, some of you may be learning about the saigas for the first time now, uh, but the saigas are the most adorable and weird looking animals that I have seen in my life. Um, they are known for their unusually large noses, uh, and saigas have also been around since the Ice Age, outliving the woolly mammoth. Uh, however, these days things go not so great for the saiga. Saiga is still strongly affected by numerous threats. A major, uh, major of them is poaching, is still ongoing in uh, Saiga country and Saiga area and required our, uh, ac uh, our activities and our attention. Second uh, major threat is industrial impact. We have very uh, strong development in our countries and Saiga and another wildlife very strong affected uh, from the uh, from side of linear uh, infrastructure, uh, industrial building, etc., etc., etc. And also, I would like to note uh, unnatural borders. It's uh, national borders of Uzbekistan and another country covered by uh, barbed fences, uh, fiber fence, and uh, they completely close the cycle migratory road during this uh, seasonal migration. And also, I would like to note disease. I know it's many of you already hear about a very strong outbreak that was happening in the territory of Russia, Kazakhstan, and Mongolia during the last decades. Saiga is known to be the fastest declining mammal species due to the sudden loss of 95% of the world population as a result of poaching and later on disease outbreak, uh, which brought saigas to the verge of extinction. Um, that being said, saiga status varies depending on the population. Uh, and apart from the threats that we've just described, uh, we have also seen quite a few conservation successes. Uh, Yelena is going to describe um, population status uh, across all five populations in the world um, right now. Yeah, uh, as you know, Saiga inhabited in Central Asia. Uh, now we have five Saiga population inhabited in territory of Kazakhstan, Russian Federation, Uzbekistan, and Mongolia. At first, uh, Saiga inhabited in territory of uh, modern Turkmenistan and China. Uh, as uh, Ole already said, uh, Last uh, two, three years, we have a uh, very visual conservation uh, success. Saiga population started increase year by the year. And now we have a uh, very good effect and a pretty uh, good status of Saiga in main uh, population. I would like to give you uh, impressions, understanding about uh, number of uh, Saiga population in each, uh, in each country. First of all, I would like to tell about Mongolia. Uh, as you know, it's uh, this population was, uh, was affected uh, by disease, and now uh, it's uh, started to restore it. A number uh, Mongolian subspecies um, uh, currently is more than ten thousand individuals. 
talking about Russia, I would like to remind you that uh, uh, cycles in the territory of this country inhabited in Caspian uh, area, uh, in Caspian Sea regions. And currently, uh, we have pretty stable status of cycle in Russia and uh, around uh, 10,000 individuals that located in this particular region. And uh, Kazakhstan uh, currently has biggest uh, number of saiga. More than 90% uh, of global population inhabited in territory of Kazakhstan Republic. And uh, currently, uh, population uh, increases at least in 40% uh, percent, uh, each year. And uh, biggest uh, population located in northwest of Kazakhstan, we call it uh, rural population. This is transboundary population. Uh, uh from Kazakhstan started to migrate the territory of Russia. And currently, uh, we are counting more than uh, 800,000 Saigas, uh, particularly in her uh, region. Next population, like it's in central part of Kazakhstan. Uh, this is a big popular population. A number of, uh, of these is uh, around 500,000 individuals. And last, I would like to tell about the super population. This is smallest population in the world. Uh, Saiga of this population inhabited in territory of Osut Lata. It's ancient Lata located in the administrative border of Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan. We share this population between each other. And uh, this population, in uh, comparison with the uh, previous one, has most uh, endangered uh, threat. Uh, currently, we uh, cal calculate only uh, 28,000 uh, Saigas. Uh, this is a big progress in comparison of uh, previous years, but still very low uh, and stable level of this population that required uh, very strong uh, conservation uh, measures to be protected. And uh, talking about Uzbekistan, I would like to express that uh, in my country, located uh, maybe a smallest number of Saigas, uh, we account uh, around 500 individuals in territory of Sud Plata and Aral Sergio. And we uh, really uh, strongly work to uh, conserve uh, this saga and uh, keep uh, uh, its chance for the uh, good future. Apart from the universal threats the saigas are facing, uh, there is a set of unique challenges the saigas are facing specifically in Uzbekistan. And these are industrial impacts, natural barriers, and climate change. Um, in terms of industrial impact, I'm referring to gas and oil sector. Uh, where activities for the extraction of these natural resources, especially now that the energy crisis is very present, are leading to land degradation and habitat loss for many species, not only the saiga, as well as noise and light pollution. Uh, saiga is a migratory species. Over the uh, season, uh, saiga moved from the northern part of the area to the southern uh, one and uh, come back to the north, uh, followed by ancient migratory route. But nowadays, uh, this migratory road completely crossed by numerous linear infrastructure. First of all, it's uh, border fences, it's railways, pipelines, and highways. And all these uh, uh, linear uh, buildings uh, uh, work uh, all together and completely negatively affect saga over the uh, seasonal migrations. Uh, and finally, climate change. Um, so the situation with climate change is quite unique in Uzbekistan, because apart from the global trends uh, of climate change that we all have observed, um, there is a very specific condition um, and changes related uh, to the RLC shrinkage, uh, which happened uh, in the 70s uh, and led to many catastrophic impacts. Um, and just for the reference, RLC used to be the fourth largest lake in the world. Uh, so you can imagine uh, what a huge impact it had uh, on uh, species on the wildlife as well as on people. Um, so we're talking about the change of habitat areas um, for the saigas uh, when they were forced to move, move towards the north from the south as a result of uh, changes in this habitat, uh, as well as uh, the change in loss of watering places, which is critical, especially on migration. Um, and um, as said before, uh, this uh, catastrophe also had a huge impact on local communities uh, because RLC used to be the major source of income for many people living around this area. Um, and not having this income source uh, led people to practice uh, poaching and unsustainable use of natural resources. 
So as you see, these are large challenges that go beyond single species conservation and require urgent solutions uh, to save unique biodiversity of the region made up of species like Saiga, um, as well as to support communities living in extremely harsh conditions. Um, now we are going to walk you through our three-step approach uh, that we take inside Conservation Alliance in order to um, tackle these big challenges. Our conservation priority are protected area, industrial partnership, local enterprise, and environmental education. Speaking about protected area, let me illustrate with our current project, Resurrection Island. Actually, a resurrection island is an existing island located in the uh, northern west of Uzbekistan at the bottom of the former Aral Sea. It's very unique territory. We inhabit so many unique and endemic species of animals and plants. I uh, can give you a list of uh, some of them. It includes uh, Saiga antelope, where you already know. It's uh, rosy flamingo, uh, caracal, harsak fox, step daughters, uh, golden eagle, imperial eagle, and many others. And of course, uh, this uh, unique territory requires very good protection. And what we would like to do now is uh, help support our government to organize a uh, national park in territory of former bottom of Aral Sea. Currently, uh, we have a very good progress. Uh, the government is signing a uh, decree uh, decree of Cabinet of Ministers of Republic of, of Uzbekistan for establishment of uh, National Park Aral Kum. Area of this uh, National Park is about 1 million hectares. It's a huge area that uh, requires a uh, very accurate and very attentive uh, zoning. It's what we do now uh, together with our partners. Uh, we are um, working very hard for the zoning of this territory to ensure protection of uh, critical uh, habitats and uh, given a chance of uh, forestry farm and industry for developing uh, this area to um, promote uh, uh, their business as um, accurate as possible. If it's impossible, uh, we try to um, avoid a negative impact and mitigation uh, this impact as much as possible. Uh, yeah, so uh, speaking about our next focus, uh, which is industrial partnerships, um, the goal here is exactly what Elena said, um, to make sure that the impacts of uh, industry on biodiversity are reduced or avoided um, where possible. So, um, for example, this year uh, we developed infrastructure maps um, for all of those um, industries located around uh, the Resurrection Island in the ROC area uh, where the Sega habitat is. Um, and uh, these infrastructure maps uh, served as a base for developing zoning for the new protected area in the region. Um, after that, uh, we also ran biodiversity impact assessment to know exactly how the industry impacts on um, animals and um, plants and uh, know which species are impacted the most and in, in what way. Um, and also at, this, at, at the same time, currently we are work, working on developing uh, training programs uh, and uh, the policy on no net loss, which again uh, is aimed at um, educating people, mostly industry workers, about um, how to reduce or avoid the impact of their um, uh, production uh, on the biodiversity and um, integrate these policies uh, on the higher level. Uh -huh. Finally, our following, uh, following priority is uh, local enterprise and environmental education. Uh, speaking about last one, I would like to note uh, several um, events. Our favorite one, first of all, it's uh, international festival, uh, Saiga Day, uh, Day that happened each uh, spring, each uh, May in all Saiga countries. Uh, this year, we organized this day in our common Saiga villages, and also we invite uh, new people from uh, new villages located in Aral Sea region. It was very beautiful, it was so many fun and uh, uh, interesting uh, activities. And uh, yeah, we also organized something new for us. Uh, we um, organized a uh, public lecture 
in a uh, two uh, key region is uh, ROC region in Lenox city and the uh, new one is Kyrgyz city located uh, in industrial zone last one was happened uh, very recently uh, just yesterday and we collected so many people uh, students and adults for the uh, very interesting lecture uh, this very specific topic the system services it was really interesting because uh, these people live in uh, industrial zone and uh, that connect uh, natural areas and for them, it was very important to understand how possible to protect a uh, natural ecosystem and how important to make balance between industrial uh, uh, in, in development and local business and uh, wildlife protection. And that leads us to a very important component of connecting uh, the wildlife, the environment to the benefits for local communities because without um, having the support from local people um, it's almost impossible to create any sustainable effort in wildlife conservation so uh, for example for this reason uh, we are interested in developing alternative sources of income for local communities um, as you may remember this rlc region is extremely um, poor uh, compared to the rest of Uzbekistan and the conditions are very harsh. Um, this area has never recovered after the uh, shrinkage of the RLC. Um, so there is a strong need to create um, extra incentives for people uh, to protect environment. Um, and we um, looked at different opportunities that are available in the region uh, and decided to develop um, ecotourism idea, uh, which for this, it seems that uh, the area is very suitable um, because again, there will be a new protected area in the region very soon. Uh, there are very unique species that you cannot see anywhere else in the rest of Uzbekistan. Um, and that creates a very interesting idea and very, very interesting possibilities for people um, and the additional incomes that are possible to develop. Uh, there are also other ideas like dark sky, for example, where uh, we are thinking about astronomical tourism or some specific com components of uh, tourism activities such as um, handicrafts. Um, we had experience uh, with such um, alternative source of income in the past and it worked very well. So we're thinking about introducing that mm -hmm. and we are not limited um, in the ideas, uh, but that's a longer topic for discussion. So we are very lucky currently to have um, support of the local government and British government in supporting uh, all these ideas and uh, tackling these difficult problems. But as you all know, uh, without you, uh, our programs also wouldn't be possible. Uh, particularly, uh, we support uh, through the uh, uh, communication with you guys uh, our program uh, for education, and of course uh, we support uh, through you uh, our program with uh, local rangers. Particularly, we support uh, Saigacha Reserve for uh, anti poaching activity in uh, Uzbekistan. So we are very happy to thank very, very much the WCN community for all the help uh, and support that you all have given to us in our programs uh, and brought us closer to um, having the Saiga populations protected worldwide. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Elena and Olya. How wonderful to hear about the influential work you're doing to protect saiga populations in their range. Um, saiga are such a unique and rare species that might be new to some of our audience. What first got you interested in that species and what made you want to commit your career to protecting them? Okay, start first. Okay, so for me, it was easy because uh, both of my parents are biologists. Um, and so they brought me to the most um, beautiful places where the saiga leaves, for example. And that uh, created a super big impression on me, especially when I was uh, very young. Um, and so I never wanted to stop and um, detach myself from this conservation world after that. For me, it was uh, very simple as well. <laughs> it's very natural, I can say, because I'm a zoologist, I'm a professional uh, biologist, and uh, I'm studying about a unique species, unique creature in my country and uh, in our Central Asian uh, region generally, and Saiga was my uh, subject of my investigation. It was very natural uh, transferring, so it came from the science, from research to the wildlife conservation, for Saiga conservation. Fantastic. Um, that actually ties into a question that came from one of our guests. Cassie Klein wanted to know if people who live in the Saiga range typically know what Saiga are, or are they surprised to learn about the species? 
Um, so I will start, I guess, but like, unfortunately, what we've seen uh, throughout our educational programs, where we would um, ask people starting from kids and also like their teachers, their parents, uh, we learned that younger generation, they don't know about the saiga because of the decline of the saiga species that happened um, in the last 20 years. Um, so for younger generation, unfortunately, we still have to teach them again about their ecosystem, not only about the saiga, but also other local species, because they don't see a lot of that anymore. Um, but for older people, um, um, it's it's a bit more um, prominent, like this knowledge of saiga antelope. Um, there are also some old stories, uh, legends related to the saiga, so it's a bit more familiar for the older generation. Yes, uh, local people who live in uh, saiga areas have um, very strong connectivity between uh, their lifestyle because uh, originally they uh, follow nomadic lifestyle. Of course, now they live settled in the villages, not move around the region so strong, but uh, in the ancient time and maybe uh, more uh, nowadays, they remember uh, about uh, their preparers that uh, travelers uh, among the Saiga area they have very strong connectivity bet be between Saiga and Saiga habitats. For, uh, first of all, uh, pastures, natural pastures, they are uh, uh, pastures and uh, watering place. So they have um, how to say, uh, inside it's very spiritual uh, connectivity between Saiga and themselves traditionally. That reflects it in their religion, song, and many interesting stories they tell and, um, I don't know, change. Exchange, yeah. Exchange between young generation and old one. And so do you guys tie the historical legends into the, the educational work that you're doing with younger generations? Awesome. Yeah. Usually we use this, yeah. Yeah, and um, also that's a very good topic that uh, kids like very much because um, uh, we would have different competitions, for example, a different contest uh, to create um, I don't know some paintings of sagas or poems uh, or short stories. And kids usually really like it because then they can also um, kind of tie their action um, as part of this um, story as one of the characters to um, conservation to like how they uh, deal with the saga, how they can actually protect those uh, sagas. So usually they quite like it quite a lot uh, to create those stories and then they can uh, transfer um, this relationship to um, the real life situations. Yeah, it's uh, our favorite uh, conservation tool, educational tool. It's uh, the uh, ecological asiate. It's mm -hmm. kids uh, create their stories and uh, show it's uh, for the uh, adults, for their parents like Seate. It looks beautiful. You featured some beautiful artwork um, earlier, and it was quite impressive that they were able to create such beautiful artwork um, of the saga, which is such a unique time also. Yeah. Um, so we all know that the Russia and Ukraine conflict is having a massive impact uh, throughout Eastern Europe. How is it impacting your guys' work? That's a very complicated question. I think it's uh, like all people. We reflected first of all uh, from the economical side. We have, we feel we already started. Uh, I don't know signs of uh, ecology, uh, economical crisis. It's of course it's reflects for the all side of our lives, and now we have very strong migration from Russia to Uzbekistan and Kazakhstan and all uh, Central Asia country. As people don't want uh, to go to the army and they completely don't want to kill people in Ukraine. Yeah, yeah. and that can be problematic for the rangers, for example, uh, because uh, we also support um, uh, Saiga populations in Russia, for example, um, and there is a wonderful protected area called um, Sipnoi Reserve, and uh, rangers there are typically males, and so right now um, there is a, an interest to uh, invite those uh, males uh, to serve in the military in Russia, so there is a concern for us, um, how can we better support rangers in Russia, but also in other states, um, because we just don't know if we'll have enough rangers soon, so that's um, that's one of the fastest, like, biggest concerns for us at the moment yeah it's not only uh, russia it's a uh, it's autonomic republic of russia it's kalmykia where saiga inhabited as part of the saiga area in caspian region and also people from this uh, autonomic republic uh, ordered uh, to go to the army and we really worry about these people about uh, safety of uh, themselves and safety of their family yeah, yeah. and in general in the world right now there's so much um I don't know, concerns and anxious feelings towards what's going to happen, a lot of uncertainty also. And that kind of shifts the priorities to protect the nature to other things when people actually need to take care of their the basic needs, uh, like safety. So with that, um, 
obviously less people now are concerned with what's going to happen to the saiga or any other uh, endangered species because they need to take care of other things and that's also very unfortunate because um conservation work still needs to be done but it's just a lot harder to do it this way yeah it's a problem we could not uh prognose the situation in the uh, future and now we like all people just uh, looking for situation and try to i don't know it's uh carry out some uh, adaptive management uh, for the situation and help as much as, uh, as they can. Mm. Yeah, it's really an unfortunate situation and we're so grateful for you guys to continue to push through on your work there. I'm assuming that that's somehow tying into some of your really high priorities right now. So could you tell us a little bit about what those priorities are and what kind of funding support you need in order to be able to accomplish those? Sure. For sure. So, um, yeah, continue the topic of um, rangers and what kind of support they need. So especially now it's critical. So before it was critical because of the COVID, because um, it was uh, really difficult to continue conservation efforts. Right now, the different concern is that we don't have enough people, but we have more area to cover um, because we are setting up a new protected area uh, in Uzbekistan. And so we actually need to uh, recruit more people and we need to train those people and obviously we need to go to the rangers that are already trained such as rangers in Russia that could train the new rangers but uh, unfortunately if um, they have to go to the military then there is very you know little exchange between the rangers and again uh, bigger concerns so people prefer to do other things so um, the biggest like one of the bigger priorities for us right now is to uh, generate enough support for the rangers to make sure that uh, for the next couple of years at least they have enough base um, to continue their work uh, in case the funding uh, from the government will be cut down which is quite possible uh, and that there is enough uh, retention and exchange between uh, different ranger groups mm. Mm. and uh, one, one more our priorities of course it's our educational program it's always a COVID time we could not uh, organize uh, as much events as uh, we really wanted because uh, all our events uh, goes uh, through the online uh, a connection with our kids. This year, fortunately, uh, we, uh, we was able to organize our beautiful events offline. Everybody was very happy and we very keen continue and accelerate our program and uh, maybe use our old experience of organizing a uh, kids camp, for instance. It was very popular and very successful experience in Uzbekistan and in other country. We'd like to organize like a previous uh, special uh, red life school for the uh, environmental teachers. It was completely ex uh, successful experience that we uh, carried out before, together uh, with San Diego Zoo, by the way. <laughs> it was very, very nice. A uh, very good exchange between American educators and educators from uh, Saiga region, from all Saiga countries. So we really keen to continue this program, and uh, we feel that it's uh, uh, our priority for the next year. Good to know. So rangers, which protect more than just the Sayaga, but everything else within that same ecosystem, and children, which is the future of conservation. So good to know. And we um, uh, them both as rangers uh, usually they uh, participate in our educational event they're happy mm -hmm. to visit kids and uh give them impression about their work about wildlife about saiga about their work in this camera traffic etc yeah fantastic um we have one question um from linda tabor beck is there any possibility of recovering the aral sea Ah, uh, it's very hard in that. <laughs> it's very complicated question. Um, we don't see any chance to uh, restore uh, our sea itself. Uh, mm -hmm. If we can about sea, about uh, aquatory, I think it's completely impossible. But what we can actually do instead of RLC, now we have very uh, interesting new uh, desert, Aralkum Desert, with unique uh, nature and the unique ecosystem. It's beautiful animals and plants. It's very uh, virgin and very uh, unique composition of uh, wild species. And what we really can do, uh, we can, um, I don't know, spend our time and our efforts for protection of this unique new ecosystem. Yeah, because there's also like yeah, it's our sea as well. <laughs> this term of saving the sea um, has a different meaning right now because for the locals, for the region, the sea is not just the water itself, but more like the region that is still um, having some um, ecosystem. But there is a tendency because of all industrial impacts and disturbance, uh, there is a tendency to lose this land that is not fertile, fertile anymore. And so, if you don't protect it right now, then there is nothing else to bring back or protect. Yeah. So, like just bringing water, if it's possible, to this uh, absolutely destroyed region 
it, it will not help anything. So it's mm-hmm. like the question is really how we can um, conserve the ecosystem, uh, regardless of how much water or lake there is still. Yeah, and we have new challenge. It's our oil and gas industry and linear infrastructure, a very strong effect on this uh, new desert, new RLC desert. And we really need to uh, think about protection this area very yep. seriously. Yeah. But being mindful of time, we've got one minute remaining for question and answers. And with WCN having a new focus on supporting young leaders and conservation or conservation leaders, um, Olya, I can't help but ask you, you're an emerging young female leader of conservation. Do you have any advice for those up and comers? Uh, yes, sure. So um, I guess don't be afraid to be interested in conservation because what I see, like speaking from my experience here in Uzbekistan, um, lots of people don't find that these concerns are important enough and young people want to become, I don't know, businessmen, lawyers, doctors, very typical, and they don't pursue their passion. And I think that's very unfortunate because there are so many interested young kids that just don't follow that. So I just want to advise to um, treat it as a serious issue and um, follow their passion if that's the case. Wonderful. Thank you so much both. It's been wonderful learning about your work. Um, We know that everything that you do for SAIGA is so invaluable for their ongoing success. So thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks so much, Laura and WCN team and everybody else joining the expo. Yeah, it'll be impossible. Thanks for having us. (laughs) Thank you. Yeah, take care. Bye. Um, So Thank you so much for the conservationists that we have had on so far. I am very excited to introduce you to yet another unique and charismatic species in conservation effort. The Harola Conservation Program is dedicated to promoting conservation of Harola antelope in Eastern Kenya along the Kenya-Somalia border. With fewer than 500 individuals, the Harola is highly endangered. The Harola Conservation Program is restoring Harola habitat in their natural range, and they have expanded their work to also protect and conserve reticulated giraffe through the community-based Somali Giraffe Project, which you'll hear more about today. Dr. Abdullahi Ali is an indigenous Kenyan conservationist born and raised in Garissa, which is the home of the Harola. In 2014, he founded the Harola Conservation Program and more recently the Somali Giraffe Project. Dr. Ali works with local Kenyans and Somalis to save these species while also improving local livelihoods. Ali is a member of the IUCN SSC Antelope Specialist Group, works as a fellow for the Zoological Society of London's Edge of Existence Group, and he also is an alumni of the Emerging Wildlife Conservation Leadership Program. Ali, tell us a little bit more about your work. Hello, greetings from Garissa. My name is Abdullahi Ali from the Hirola Conservation Program and the Somali Giraffe Project based in Eastern Kenya. In this region, which is on the Kenya-Somali border, we are currently experiencing one of the worst droughts that we have ever seen in our lifetime. As you can see, it is dry, hot, and windy. And with four failed rainy season, this has affected nearly 3.4 million people in this region and numerous wildlife species across the region, including the reticulated Somali giraffe, also one of the most beautiful giraffe subspecies that we have. And as you can see, they are resting behind me here. And today, we were going to share more about the plight of giraffes in this region. So we have three subspecies of giraffes in Kenya, namely the Maasai, Rothschild, and the reticulated that you're seeing behind me here, uh, out of the nine subspecies that occur in Africa. Across the African continent, giraffes have been, failing, have, have been facing silent extinction Uh, with their population reported to have declined by 40% over the last three decades. And uh, what that means is that there are four times more elephants in Africa than giraffes are. And that is uh, surely shocking statistics. And uh, for those of you who might not know uh, the difference between the different subspecies, let me show you how a Somali giraffe looks like. Come with me. So the reticulated giraffe is considered the most beautiful out of all the giraffe uh, nine subspecies that we have in Africa. Of course, 
you can see their coat pattern is quite unique these large patches uh, liver colored patches outlined by networks of white lines that sometimes can run all the way to their down to their legs and the males can reach a towering height of up to 18 feet and they can weigh almost 4,000 uh, 4, pounds so they are really really massive animal as you you will see uh, as we walk closer to it I think I'll just bother this one to stand so that you see the perspective uh, the perspective uh, in in relation to human height and they're so calm so used to us so you can see the difference yeah sorry for that so in northeastern kenya we are working with the largest population of reticulated giraffes in kenya and uh, this is the largest part of the range yet is the most vulnerable part of their range given that uh, there are no formally government protected areas and their presence here hinges on the tolerance of the local communities and the threats are quite quite many as well uh, including the drought which we are currently battling uh, habitat loss you, as we go around the landscape you will see uh, some of the fragmentation uh, in on their habitat including fences concrete blocks that are coming up we also have intensified human wildlife conflict that is happening here and uh, in other areas you will often hear of elephant human conflict carnivore human conflict but giraffe human wildlife giraffe human conflict is very pronounced here in northeastern uh, kenya uh, in addition, we also have significant infrastructure development that are coming up uh, and that are transacting through critical giraffe habitat uh, and road kill is a major, major issue that we are also battling. But for this year, we are focusing on the drought mitigation measures and you will see some of the conservation actions that we are doing, including feeding of giraffes that we have seen wild giraffes uh, it has been an issue to figure out how and what to feed them we're also doing water tracking where we are taking drawing water from the main river tana river uh, it's just on a mile away from where we are uh, it's the longest uh, river in kenya and it's a permanent river uh, and we are also doing intensive anti-poaching in which we are monitoring um, you know uh, bush trade that is also uh, quite prolific in this part of, 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 of the range. Uh, human wildlife conflict uh, is another issue that we are tackling. And uh, giraffes have been, because of the drought, uh, they are targeting mango, uh, mango trees, uh, which is also the most common uh, crop here. Uh, so they are eating the flowers of the mangoes and in retaliation the farmers are attacking the giraffes uh, you know with crude weapons so you will see as we walk around you might see you know many injuries uh, these giraffes having many injuries and that uh, we are doing uh, you know strong awareness uh, where we are working with the local communities and the farmers to ensure that we are uh, we are able to design a way they can coexist together yeah, as I mentioned earlier, we are experiencing one of the worst droughts in this region that are uh, affecting both humans and wildlife in equal measures. Some of the impacts that we have seen include intensified human wildlife conflicts, uh, lack of water or shortage of water across the region, and also horrible scenes of malnourished humans and wildlife. And wildlife. And, uh, if you will probably see or look around the landscape you will see most trees have no leaves at all there's no grass there's no understory uh, so it's really horrific situation uh, however all is not lost and we are doing all we can to ensure that we survive this catastrophe so let's head to the field now and uh, meet uh, sangale edwin who is out in the field and see what he's up to thank you so much uh, dr ali my name is Edwin Sangale and I coordinate the drought response team. I'm here in one of the water troughs that we have for giraffes here in northern Garissa. Uh, in, in the northern Garissa, communities and wildlife have to really work 
long distances to access water. Since most of the water ponds are dry, uh, there are not much water trust like this, especially for wildlife. Uh, and further, some of the boreholes have dried up and some of the equipment have been vandalized. Hence, there are just a few boreholes that serve people here. Hence, it's a really great challenge to communities and uh, giraffes here to access water. To address the water shortage, uh, we, are use, we are applying various methods to ensure that uh, communities and one life have access to water up here without going down to the river, which is uh, a great distance for them. Hence, uh, we are using methods such as water tracking where we fetch water from the river and uh, bring it all the way here to replenish and uh, supply to this uh, water troughs and also supplying to community areas. Uh, this ensures that they don't have to cover large distances to access water. And further for wildlife, Moso giraffes, it, reduce, it reduces the danger of road kills in major highways such as the Garissa Modogashi Highway that cuts across their habitat. Hence we are able to really save them a great deal. For the community also we are also to we, we also offer fuel subsidies for their boreholes. There are just a few remaining boreholes around here and we offer fuel subsidies since their water pumps are uh, fuel powered. We give them fuel so that they can pump water for well, for their livestock during the day and also ensure that they have to pump water for wildlife during the night. Because since we we started visiting the boreholes. Uh, we saw a lot of giraffes around the boreholes, but they were just looking from a distance. They can't access water. And uh, the community was saying, uh, we just have fuel to pump water for our livestock. Uh, we don't have enough to also pump for giraffes. So we, ha we really had to step in to ensure that uh, also they have fuel to pump for giraffes and that they can pump some for their livestock. And uh, we are seeing an impact already, at least uh, giraffes and other wildlife don't have to go down to the river. The communities also are, are accessing fresh water uh, up here through, water, through our water trucks uh, and it's a great deal for them. And uh, we just hope that uh, the water shortage will end soon. Otherwise, we are doing everything to ensure that uh, everything is going well. In summary, our water distribution program has benefited over 5,000 households and has also seen five conservan community conservancies benefiting. In these community conservancies, we have renovated and constructed uh, 10 new uh, water troughs for wildlife such as this one here. And uh, these water troughs have enabled the conservancies to create a safe space for wildlife during these difficult times. And now let's cross over to Abdraman, who is at our main camp. He coordinates the wildlife supplementary feeding program. Where they are working hard to ensure that uh, they sustain giraffes and uh, create resilience for them during this uh, drought period. Thank you so much, Edwin. My name is Abdraman Mohamed, and I'm here at our main giraffe feeding trough here at our camp. I coordinate SGP's wildlife and livestock feeding a supplementary feeding program. Due to the current prolonged drought, we had to intervene to save wildlife and livestock from starving as forage resources diminished. In, in various wildlife concentration areas, we set up temporary wildlife feeding troughs and assembly hubs for herders to pick up supplies. On a weekly basis, we replenish the temporary wildlife feeding troughs with a kesha pots, lusan haze, and nutritional pellets. Thank you so much, uh, Abdurrahman. Let's now cross over to Ali Hassan, who's in Southern Garissa in Bura East, a very decorated ranger and a recent winner of the IUCN WCPA uh, Ranger Award. He's a very decorated ranger and does a lot of uh, work mentoring other young rangers in Garissa County and more so the Bura East uh, Conservancy and the Arawale region in general. Thank you so much, Edwin. My name is Ali Hassan, and I coordinate our ant potting activities. Our team comprises of a camel unit and a motorbike unit. 
Riding on camels and motorbikes enables this unit to penetrate in the remotest area of our conservation area. During our patrol, we look out for poachers and snares, as well as snare giraffes. We report on snare giraffes to ensure that they are treated and freed from snare. These organized patrols enable us to intercept pet poachers and flush them out of poaching hotspots to ensure the safety of giraffes. One of the poaching hotspots is the Arawale area, where poaching activities are fueled by the cross-border bushmeat trade. As our response measure, we recently formed a new unit who are stationed at the newly renovated Arawale ant poaching outpost. Having more boots on the ground will go a long way to, in the reduction of the poaching activities in the area. Thank you so much, Ali. My name is Ifra Mohamedeko, a community education officer. The community is an essential pillar when it comes to conservation of endangered reticulated giraffe. Therefore, we have tried to engage the community in different programs to increase their conservation awareness and building the local capacity. We have tailored our programs to include school visits, cinemas, workshops, and celebrating the World Giraffe Day with the community. Through our program, we were able to reach out to over 2,000 pastoralists while mentoring and nurturing the next generation of conservationists through our education program where we work with the local schools. In the long run, we have planned to work with over 30 local schools and reaching out to 6,000 school children where we plan to impact them with the knowledge of conservation through activities such as school visit, wildlife cinemas, and taking them through conservation career pathway. So I think during this time is when giraffes start uh, coming in. So we'll just move aside and let them quench their thirst. So it's just been five minutes since we replenished the water pan and already a giraffe male is here. So at least, yeah, we see that we are making an impact here in the wild and we're happy that the giraffes are now utilizing the water. As you might have seen, we are going through one of the worst droughts in northeastern Kenya with four failed rainy seasons and the fifth one expected, expected to also underperform. What that means is that we continue to provide emergency services and these giraffes you are seeing also rely on our support and we rely on your continued support. With that, until next time, we say goodbye. Thank you so much, Ali, and thank you for all you're doing to protect these amazing species while also supporting the local communities during this difficult time of drought. Um, to start, can you tell us a little bit about how you first became interested in conservation and what made you commit your career to the conservation of giraffe and Herola? Thank you so much, Laura. Um, um, I started conservation way back when I was in high school uh, during a visit in the Masai Mara, Great Masai Mara region. And of course, my home area uh, is the home of the Herola and also the largest part of the reticulated giraffes. So at the collapse of the Somali Republic, which is just on the next door of uh, our study uh, area, uh, many giraffes uh, from Somalia moved also into uh, northeastern part of Kenya. And uh, as a result, uh, we started hosting refugee giraffes, uh, some with injured, uh, some injured with gunshots. And that's how uh, we started uh, giraffe conservation work. Uh, and we started working with different communities uh, to protect giraffes in Northeastern Kenya. A question from one of our guests, um, from Morgan Farrell. What sort of training is involved and does one have to go through in this country of Kenya to become a certified ranger? Uh, now you, it's a different level. Uh, I think you can start uh, at a basic level where you, you get basic training at the community level. Uh, but if you want to become certified, there's a formal government school uh, by, run by the Kenya Wildlife Service and other uh, agencies uh, to uh, undergo uh, intensive training and you become a certified ranger. And so you, you talked a lot about human wildlife conflict in the region and, and the work that you're doing with all of the species there. Um, but what is the primary reason that giraffe are poached? Is there an awareness to their value to the community as far as ecotourism? Is, is, that's a question from one of our guests, David Feldler. I mean, we, we, we work along areas along the Kenya-Somali border, which is a volatile region. Uh, so it's outside mm -hmm. the, 
the typical tourist circuit in Kenya. Um, so um, what that means is that there, there are no tourists, uh, it means there's no tourism at all. Uh, but there's also uh, intensive uh, cross-border bushmeat trade uh, in which giraffe meat is you know, taken from Kenya and taken to Somalia and traded back with other commodities like sugar, uh, which comes in from uh, the border. Well, I didn't realize that. Um, so since starting your work with the giraffe in the region, have you seen a change in the local community's behavior as far as being more welcoming to giraffe in the range or being more open to protecting them? Uh, yes, of course, uh, we have uh, new community conservation areas that are coming up and uh, we get a lot of reports on giraffe poaching across the range, uh, but we have other challenges of new communities, new migrants who are moving in into the region and they're coming in with different cultures. Uh, the, the primary community we work with are Somalis, uh, they are pastoralists, they keep livestock, they often don't hunt uh, bushmeat, uh, but there's a lot of uh, other communities from elsewhere in Kenya that are colonizing uh, and moving into the area and are really uh, you know, big threat to giraffes and uh, the heritage that was preserved in this region. Mm -hmm. So the work that you're doing specifically in providing water to the draft um, clearly is benefiting local communities, local communities, livestock. What other wild species are benefiting from that water? Um, uh, there are warthogs, uh, the uh, warthog, there are the gravy zebra, uh, there are granules, uh, there are bisa oryx uh, in, in, in this region, um, and uh, Somalia Street is also here. Um, of course, there are also large cannibals, uh, big cats, all the big cats are here, uh, and, you know, suits of other uh, smaller ungulates like dick dicks and uh, 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 dick dicks, uh, oribi, uh, and a uh, few others, of course. So one of our guests, Tammy Collier, um is asking if, we ex if you expect to have rains this season, or do you think it's going to continue to be another dry season? So they already forecasted 65% uh, rain, uh, and that will be the fifth consecutive season. Uh, the landscape is really dry, as you have seen in the video. And uh, of course, with this accumulative, uh, uh, you know, dry uh, situations carried over, um, I think it could mean uh, really bad times ahead. And how are you able to keep up hope? Um, it's got to be really challenging, the work that you're doing, but I know that you're doing amazing work, so you must be very hopeful. Yes, home is always the best. I was born and raised here. And uh, although I've never seen this kind of drought, uh, uh, I want to make sure uh, that these uh, animals, uh, the communities, um, uh, and the whole ecosystem survive. Can you, so we're, we're speaking about giraffe predominantly because you, um, that was the focus of the session, but I'd be remiss not to touch on Harola, which is where you started your work. Could you tell us just a little bit about your Harola conservation work in the region? So Harola is a globally endangered species. Uh, it's a close relative of other antelopes in, in Africa, the wildebeest, uh, the hartebeest, the toki, uh, probably you are familiar with, uh, uh, but it's a unique, uh, species is the only extant member of that entire genus called Vitricus. Uh, so it's the only species surviving. They do not occur in captivity in zoos. And there are about 500 left uh, in just a pocket of uh, where we work. Uh, so they are really uh, at the brink of uh, extinction. The primary threat facing them is habitat loss. And uh, the habitat loss that they are facing is uh, they used to rely on elephants to maintain and open the habitat for them. But at the height of poaching in Kenya in the 1980s, all the elephants, about 5,000, uh, you know, were extirpated locally. What that led is massive tree encroachment into their uh, landscape, uh, about 300% increase. And they are entirely dependent and subsist on, on grasses. So they are facing acute food shortage, uh, malnutrition, and of course, uh, they are currently affected by the ongoing climate change. And uh, we're fighting all this to make sure that they also bounce back and thrive once again. And so if I remember correctly, part of the work you were doing was actually re removing some of the undergrowth so they had more grazing land. Is that correct? Correct. Uh, yeah. because, of this, because of this invasive trees, we are thinning down. We, are not, uh, we don't have the elephants anymore. So we are acting as the elephants and trying to thin down this uh, habitat and opening the spaces for them. Uh, and the overall goal is to ensure that we impact some of the key life stages like pregnancy rate, survival, 
uh, and recruitment and eventually uh, bolster the population. Mm. It's fantastic work. Um, we have, going back to giraffe, we have another question that's come in regarding um, poachers. I think you touched on this a little bit as far as uh, meat being traded back and forth. Is that being done at a local level or is that being done by organized poachers? Uh, lately has become a bit of organized poachers and it's a combination actually. Uh, there's a lot of uh, local poaching uh, coming in from uh, these migrants into the region. And uh, there's also um, organized cross-border bushmeat trade in which vehicles that bring in goods from Somalia, uh, like sugar and uh, other essential commodities like milk, which come in cheap uh, from the Somali region because of the connectivity of the Indian Ocean and also uh, maybe lack of uh, proper taxation policy. Uh, they come in as, uh, as counter, counterfeits and, uh, and contrabands. Uh, and when they are going back, they go back with the giraffe meat. Uh, mm -hmm. So it's, it's getting a bit organized. Uh, and uh, also the same region is uh, where we're hosting the largest refugee population at the DAP camp, uh, which is hosting uh, Somali refugees and other nationals from Southern Sudan and elsewhere where we have conflict across Africa. And all these people uh, somewhere, somehow rely on uh, uh, bush meat. And giraffe, of course, uh, uh, is the most valuable. Uh, animal they can find easily. I've got a fun fact question. Um, what is the most interesting fact about giraffe that you think our audience would enjoy hearing? <laughs> of course, they're the tallest mammal. <laughs> um, thank you so much. Um, so understanding that obviously with the drought, there's there's a lot of challenges right now and the work that you are doing, I'm sure is incredibly intensive to be able to feed all of those giraffe. What are your biggest priorities right now and, and what kind of funding support are you looking for in order to be able to provide those? Uh, the two immediate needs that we have, one is to sustain uh, this emergency program that we have, given that the forecast is of rain was really poor and the situation is already deplorable there in uh, northeastern Kenya. Uh, so we want to continue uh, feeding and supplying water across this region, and we need uh, financial support uh, to sustain this. Uh, in addition, we also want to have uh, to uh, scale up our anti poaching effort. Uh, from uh, you know the camel unit and the motorbike unit to uh, you know vehicle mobile uh, unit, uh, and that requires a little bit more of capital. Uh, so if we could get uh, those two, uh, I think it will be uh, drastically uh, improve the situation conservation situations on the ground. Mm. Um, thank you. We have a question from one of our guests. Linda Mercurio is asking um, if drought is expected to continue, are there options for relocation or expanding rangeland for giraffes so that they have more food resources? Uh, and no, um, because this uh, northeastern Kenya is a huge part of Kenya and also the immediate uh, the immediate border region, which is Northern Kenya, is also experiencing similar situation. Uh, so it doesn't uh, logistically uh, uh, make sense to relocate, uh, given that uh, we have the largest population of, of giraffes in this region, the biggest part of the range, uh, and also the communities um, have tribal boundaries. And so it's a complicated uh, scenario to imagine. We could tell from, from um, the footage that you shared that the giraffe are really comfortable in your presence, um, which is impressive to be able to see that compare and contrast of size between you and an adult male. Have you found that to be difficult for them when they're back out in the local landscape? Have you seen any conflict arise from that? Um, so the, because, of the, because of the drought, uh, a lot of people have lost livestock. So they're irrigating along the river. Uh, what that has done is that people have started fencing along the river, so giraffes are no longer able to access uh, the natural water source. Uh, and because of food scarcity on the, uh, uh, their dispersal sites, they are moving into the farmlands and uh, eating the crops, uh, particularly mangoes. And that has caused a lot of conflict between farmers and, and giraffes, and we have seen retaliatory 
killings of giraffes. Uh, we have seen farmers complain, uh, and uh, we are working toward uh, uh, developing a new project on sustainable, um, thriving farmers and also thriving giraffe population. And we are working together to see uh, how we can achieve win-win situation. Uh, and one uh, scenario we're entertaining is uh, if we can link companies to buy produce directly from the farmers uh, mm -hmm. so that we minimize loss and uh, allow them to tolerate giraffes on their farms. And of course, uh, we are encouraging domestic agro-tourism where people can visit the farms uh, uh, whenever they come to see giraffes as well. That would be fantastic. I'm sure many of us would be interested to see that. Um, so I don't want to miss the opportunity to touch on um, what inspirational work that you do, especially as somebody who was born and raised in your local community and has come back to do such amazing conservation work in that space. Um, knowing that there is a lot of up and coming conservationists in the world, do you have any advice for, for those that are up and coming on, on how to be successful in this space? Yes, um, it's a long road, of course, um, but uh, is to build, uh, a, you know, it's a sequence. So you build on, you know, positive things. Uh, you uh, continue to identify opportunities and don't miss, you know, any opportunity, uh, whether it's, you know, directly or indirectly beneficial and uh, keep going, you will make it. Thank you so much, Dr. Ali. I think we've reached time on questions. Um, I know it's exceptionally late in Kenya right now. So thank you so much for being up so late to answer the questions of everyone um, and just such amazing work that you were doing. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Well, that concludes our final session for day one of our Wildlife Conservation Expo. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, as a reminder, there are still tickets available for this Friday's 20th anniversary celebration with Jane Goodall. If you are in San Francisco, uh, you can get those online at wcnexpo.com. Um, if you were inspired by any of our conservationists you heard from today, please consider contributing to their work. There are no donations too small and none too big. 100% of designated funds goes directly to the conservation program of your choice, and you can support them through our website at wildnet.org. If you would like to learn more about WCN and our partners, you can also sign up for newsletters on that same website. Additionally, we're going to need your help to help shape the future of Expo. So on Friday, everyone will be receiving a survey in your email that will take less than 10 minutes to complete. Your feedback helps us to make Expo better each year and each time, and we're sweetening the deal this time by offering a chance to win a special WCN 20th anniversary blanket to one randomly chosen survey respondent. I need to see if I can get it on that. We look forward to hearing your feedback and thoughts on Expo. Um, we'll be back on Monday, October 3rd at 9 a.m. Pacific time for our next day of talks all about women who save wildlife. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. We know everyone is so incredibly busy. Um, please help us to spread the word. Friends and family can still register for Expo online this week if you'd like to share it with them. And we really look forward to seeing you again here soon. Have a wonderful afternoon, everyone. <laughs>